Hello, I just wanted to let everybody know that we are just waiting for quorum to start the meeting. So I will be placing the the phone call on the phone on mute, okay? So I took all the I went around the, the horizon. Horizon's open. The horizon wasn't open? I just can't see. Well, they just, I yeah. think. Thank you very much. This meeting of the City of Socorro City Council is set to begin. First and foremost, the City of Socorro would like to thank everyone and ask you for your patience during this difficult time we have been presented with. Everyone, please remember to silence any electronics to avoid sound interruption. No disruptive behavior or outbursts will be tolerated and violators are subject to call disconnection and possible prosecution. In accordance with section 418.016 of the Texas Government Code and by order of the Office of the Governor issued March 16, 2020, the City Council of the City of Socorro will conduct the meeting scheduled today, Thursday, March 19, 2020 at 6 p.m., which is now 6.02 at City Hall Chambers, 6860 Rio Vista Road, Socorro, Texas, by telephone conference and we'll be live streaming the meeting in order to advance the public health goal of limiting the number of people physically present at our location to slow the spread of the coronavirus COVID-19. The public that signed up and any presenters will be called upon by the presiding officer during the meeting to speak during public comment or their agenda item during the meeting following government code 551.042. La Junta del Concilio de la Ciudad de Socorro está por comenzar. Primeramente queremos darles las gracias y pedimos su paciencia durante estos momentos críticos que enfrentamos. Favor de poner en silencio. Favor de poner en silencio. Todo equipo electrónico para evitar interrupción de sonido. No se va a tolerar ningún tipo de comportamiento perjudicial o revoltoso. A quien no siga estas reglas, su llamada será desconectada y puede ser infraccionado. De acuerdo de sección 418.016 del Código del Gobierno de, de Texas por orden de la Oficina del Gobernador, anunciada el 16 de marzo de 2020, El Concilio de la Ciudad de Socorro tendrá su junta hoy, 19 de marzo de 2020 a las 6 p.m. en la Sala del Concilio, 860 Rio Vista Road, Socorro, Texas. Por medio de teléfono y la junta estará transmitiéndose en vivo para tomar medidas preventivas, limitado la, limitando la presencia del público en este sitio para prevenir la propagación de la enfermedad del virus corona COVID-19 a los demás. El público y los presentadores serán anunciados por el oficial conduciendo la junta para poder hablar durante la sección de comentario público 
o después de la discusión del artículo de la agenda por cual se apuntaron siguiendo las reglas del gobierno 551.042. Six oh five. The meeting is now called to order. Mr. Rate, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three, establishment of Cora. Rene Rodriguez is absent. Cesar Nevarez. Here. Ralph Duran. Here. Mayor Elia Garcia. Here. Victor Perez. Here. And Ivan Colombia Lopez. Here. Mayor, we have a quorum. Item number four, public comment. We have uh, several speakers. Our first speaker is Juan Flores. Señor Flores, tiene tres minutos. Señor Flores. Juan Flores. Mr. Juan Flores. Miriam Cruz. Hello. Hello. Yes. Ms. Cruz, you have three minutes. Thank you. Karina Álvarez. Ms. Karina Álvarez. Yes. Ms. Álvarez, you have three minutes.
Ms. Alvarez. Ms. Alvarez, ¿tiene tres minutos? No, she can't hear. Can you speak up? Ms. Alvarez, ¿tiene tres minutos? Puede hablar sobre sus sugerencias que tenga. Ok, Ms. Karina, ahorita cuando llegamos a su artículo vamos a discutir en más detalle. Gracias por participar. César Ornelas. Mr. Ornelas. Tiene tres minutos para hablar sobre su sugerencia. Gracias. Gracias. Juan Flores. 
señor Flores? Señor Flores? Yes, go ahead, sir. Mr. Flores, your time is up. Mr. Flores, your, your time is up. We'll go ahead and discuss um, your item in more detail when we get to it. Thank you for participating, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mayor, for the record, Mr. René Rodriguez arrived to the meeting at 6.13. Moving on to consent agenda, do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Rodriguez? Aye. Cicero Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colon Villalobos? Yes. Item number 11. Discussion and action to approve and ratify resolution 613 authorizing the submission of a grant application to the U.S. Department of Justice fiscal year 2020 COPS hiring program for the Socorro Police Department. Make the city's match contribution is 247412 with 20 cents. Make a motion to approve. Second. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Alejandra Olades, Grants Coordinator for the City of Socorro. 
Uh, we did submit an application to the U.S. Department of Justice's TOPS office for the hiring of six new law enforcement officers for the Socorro Police Department. There is a 25% match requirement for this grant. The grant will cover 75% uh, of the cost of salaries, benefits for those six officers over a 36-month period. In total, our local match commitment will be $247,412.20 over the course of 36 months. If you look at the agenda item, there is a breakdown of our local match per year. So each year it increases a little bit, but the total is still um, the $247,000. Um, this will come out of our general fund and we are required to, to get your approval to, for the application. René Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalobos? Yes. Item number 12, discussion and action to approve and ratify resolution 614, authorizing the submission of a grant application to the U.S. Department of Justice Fiscal Year 2020 COPS Community Policing Development Micro Grants Program for the Socorro Police Department. There is no match requirement for this grant. Motion to approve. Second. Second. This is another application to the U.S. Department of Justice for the FY 2020 COPS Community Policing Development Micro Grants Program for the Socorro Police Department. There is no match requirement for this grant. We did submit an application requesting $62,860 in funding for the salary and benefits of one youth partnerships coordinator and the Police Athletics League. Uh, the youth partnership coordinator will spearhead the development of the Police Athletics League and recruit a minimum of 120 at-risk youth, track a reduction in delinquency outcomes for the youth that participate in the program, uh, and then it also provides for funding for all of the equipment, sports equipment, uh, and supplies that will be needed by the youth participating in the program. I think... Mr. Rodriguez? I think this is great. I mean, you know, if we can save uh, at least 10 of those 120 youths, it's great. I, I just like the outreach, and I think that it's going to be great for our community, uh, seeing that what has transpired in the last couple of months here in Socorro. René Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalobos? Yes. Item number 13, discussion and action to approve necessary purchases in order to make the new police headquarters move in ready. Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, David Burton, Chief of Police. Um, so I'm happy to tell you that over the last two weeks that uh, the police department has opened on uh, 240 North Moon um, and we've started moving process. As a matter of fact, we're almost about 90% complete with our moving. Uh, we only have a few more personnel to go. Uh, we do need some additional uh, funding as far as finishing the building. Uh, so up to this point, up to this point, we've spent the five hundred and forty thousand dollars for the building itself, and then I uh, put in another hundred thousand dollars from our asset forfeiture. So we're at six hundred and forty thousand um, to finish the building. The estimate is about one hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars. That would cover wow. such things as all of our electronics, which runs about twenty six thousand for the new computer systems, etc. That we're going to need for the officers. Um, there's another $26,000 that's going to need uh, be needed for blacktop uh, to finish the paving. Um, there's about $9,000 in landscaping that needs to be done. Um, there's another about $5,000 in parking because uh, we need stoppers and lines to be finished. Um, so we do have uh, some additional costs that we need to, uh, to, to make. We're asking for the $75,000 or so for you to consider the $75,000 to come out of the uh, capital improvement fund that uh, the city acquired, uh, but it will take 140, just so you have that information, it will take $140,000 to finish it completely. The other thing that we need is we need some bulk uh, evidence storage items 
uh, us, I'm sorry, containers that we would put on the property where we could put large items that we can't put inside the uh, building. Uh, we need two of those, and they run about $5,000 a piece. Mr. Rodriguez? So, so you're asking for 75, but you really need 140. We're trying to be responsible. Uh, I understand and that that funding is earmarked for other things. Of course. So. But we, we, we also understand that, you know, it's, it's for our community and, and, and safety. And I, and I think that, you know, since we already went and did the investment, I think that we should just get it up and running. And, and, and just give, for me, my personal is give them the full amount so that it can be ready to go. Um, is that all you're going to need? Does that include the, the, the containers? The yes, it does, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to get, um, we, we need a little bit of robust uh, type security building. So it's not a matter of going out and buying uh, knock, down, knock down or self um, build storage containers we have to actually build something that is hard for people to tamper with and get right. into so that's a little bit more money for us of course, of course. so could, could i amend my motion to approve the 140 and then see if because we need to put an amount correct <coughs> So it just okay. has to be part of the motion. Right. So that's what I'm the saying. I'm, I'll amend my motion. However, to... we have, um, I know that uh, our city planner has additional costs because we do need sidewalks. So to completely have it operational from an ADA com uh, component is that we need the sidewalks. The, the, the department also needs asphalt in the back. And then also the decking that would circumvent the entire area. So we, my estimate that we're, we're looking at about an additional 100,000. 100,000. So I'll make my motion to approve to 100, uh, 240,000 to complete our police department. Second. Ms. Velos, um, before we, we jump into that, I know that you, you asked for 75, and obviously you did that for a reason. If not, you would have come back and you would have said, 140 what we need now are, are you expecting other funds to come in uh, to offset this are we expecting more funds or this is just just no. because right now this is what you need but you knew you know that down the road we're gonna need more right ma'am so what we had to do was look at what we needed that was critical to op to open the building so uh, additional uh, black topping some flood mitigation because uh, the front of that building is is uh, gets flooded the entranceway uh, so we need to put that in. Those would be critical type. Um, so that would be the 75,000. We would then need to increase our budget. If we didn't go with the full amount right now, we would need to increase our budget for the next budget cycle in order to complete that the building. Correct. So we had planned on doing it on phases. However, the, our finance director does recommend that we use capital funds, and that's the reason why we acquired them. He was just trying to be fiscal responsible and just said, okay, we'll go in phases. Well, However, that is what he needs in order to, for it to be totally complete. Well, and, and the reason I say this is because I tell this to my family, if you're going to do it, do it right the first time because it's going to cost more later. Yeah. Is that where we're at here? I, I believe that if we don't make, I mean, you're going to add the percentage increase, right? So year to year, I figure it's going to go up 10%, but what, so whatever prices that we have now, you know, we're going to be probably be paying the 10% more on top of that. So. Gotcha. Right. Mr. Perez? I'm all for it, but how does this impact anything that we previously planned? I mean, just so in terms of uh, projects, what is going to have to go by the uh, be postponed in the meantime? Correct. So we weren't planning on the 140. We have to go back and reassess uh, because I also know that we want to bring up a list of an updated list for paving in order for us to move money around during the five-year capital improvement plan. Um, however, we have uh, the investment group has invested funding and it's acquiring um, like in one month we, we did $30,000 in just 32, interest. 32 right? point so <clears throat> we're not spending them as quickly as we thought just because of the weather and, and um, so I do think that it, it's 
we'll be able to by the time that, yes so we'll be able to uh, without having to remove any of the items that we've already accounted for I'm, mr rodriguez and just to add to that we we put more money into the investment so we should get a return about what, 72 thousand seventy four. So it, as, as we continue moving forward with that, we are uh, receiving a good percentage right now. So, I mean, it's, it's, we can still keep continue making that. And I, I can, I, I'm on board. I just want to make sure that, that some of those things that we prioritized in terms of mm -hmm. uh, vital things for the city aren't also just put on the wayside. I mean, that we can, that we can do some while at the same time uh, outfit the police department and it should be outfit. Mm -hmm. Mayor, we have a speaker, Miriam Cruz. Ms. Cruz. Oh, we can't hear you. There we go. You're ready. Is that now you can hear me? Yes. Ms. Cruz, your time is up. Ms. Elvis? I, I think um, to answer Ms. Miriam's question, um, if we were to go into a mode where we would be in uh, dire need for the city and change, we could, n not all this money would be spent all at once, correct? That's correct, ma'am. Uh, the other thing too, is just so you know, the, the police department, the new police department building is set up for the new EOC. So in all, if we did have a disaster on our hands where we needed to bring staff in to coordinate a response, it would be from the new police department. So that funding is important, especially the electronic funding is important for us to make sure that that happens correctly. Um, and then the second thing, I just want to answer um, Ms. Cruz's concern. We're going to keep the other buildings as substations for right now. So we're not going anywhere. They could still go to those buildings uh, we'll put signs up next to them saying, hey, if there's, that they're unmanned, but if you need police assistance, please contact the dispatch center and we'll send a unit to that building. They don't have to come to us. We'll go to them. Thank you. René Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalobos? Yes. At this time, would we entertain a motion to move item number 21 um, next? Motion to uh, move item 21. Second. Next on the agenda. Rene Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalobos? Yes. Item number 21 Discussion and action regarding disaster declaration, its extension and limitations, procedures and changes triggered and imposed by the declaration. Yes. And we have Mr. Ricardo Gonzalez, who is our battalion chief present. Yes. Hello, uh, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me up. I uh, apologize, first of all, for uh, Mr. Resendez um, 
our health director was supposed to come out here and present. I was just kind of given this last moment. But um, as you can see, there, there's a lot of items going on with the COVID ID and how things go. Um, I do have some handouts, and I don't know if I could approach the bench. Um, and just want to cover some of the items that um, were some literature that we're, we're presenting. <clears throat> I'll wait a little bit till that gets handed out. So on the first page, as you, um, as you can see, I have some uh, comparisons for the flu and COVID ID and, and just the importance of what we're trying to accomplish through this, uh, this the disaster declarations. And just a comparison, COVID ID on the right, it shows the, the mortality rate on people that have been affected and the age groups. As you can see, if when you look at 80 year olds and above and, um, the mortality rate is about 15% for somebody uh, of uh, 80 years and above. When you look at 70 to 79, that mortality rate cuts in half almost to 8%. And 60 to 69 year olds go to three and three and a half percent, almost 3.6. And then from 50 to 59, 1.3. And as you can see, each step of those decade blocks, it decreases by almost half each time. And then it's pretty much very very little 0.2 or 0.4 when it comes to 10 years old to 50 years old so those are mortality rates compared of how uh the flu is also uh, the death rate by that so that's why the importance of the declaration and why the move of all these isolation measures and and social distancing that is thinking that is occurring on the bottom of this, you can see the Ebola and some all, some other viruses that were that you can compare this to, the Ebola, SARS, MERS, and then compared to uh, COVID-19 that we're looking at. The fatality rate compared to these other um, coronaviruses are, if you look at the says fatality rate, 40% for Ebola, 9.6, 34 for MERS. And then it's only 3.4% for COVID ID, but you can see the importance of this is, is to, to like a calming voice to say, okay, we've lived and we've gone through experience some other uh, coronaviruses that are out there, but the reasons that we're trying to, to do the social distances is because of the age factors and how we can, we can limit those that spread of disease. On the following page, you look at the curve without doing anything. So the larger curve, on the bell curve, it looks at if we don't do anything and you don't do pre uh, preventive measures, the spike is really, really quick and it might go um, a lot of people getting exposed right away. But if you look at the dotted line in between, that's a healthcare system capacity. So if we look at the healthcare system capacity, if we don't do take any precautionary measures, it'll spike up quick and maybe ex exceed for sure all our capabilities that we have as medical components and first responders and hospital uh, care facilities. <clears throat> but if we do, do uh, take some precautionary measures and distance and keep our uh, hand washing and sanitizing as we work precaution, the, the virus and exposure might flatten out. It might take, and we might have that exposure virus longer time compared to just having him in a, a peak and everybody gets it. It might take longer for us to be exposed to that, but <coughs> the measure is going to be a lot less people sick. Longer time as people get exposed, but the, me the exposure is going to be a lot less people at a time to where our healthcare providers and in, in our system for uh, first responders who are able to respond to all that. And then just the power of social, di so social distancing graphic on the back as well. As you can see if somebody is infected with, it, with no... Um, no social distancing within five days of that. How, how many people will be in 30 days? In five days, 2.5 people infected. 
uh, in 30 days, 406 uh, six, uh, people infected, if you have that one infection. If you do 50% less exposure, or if you go 75 less exposure, you can see how dramatic that exposure results. And that is the, the reason of the uh, declarations and the protective measures that we're trying to take. And, and basically, uh, do you have any questions on that? No, just a comment. Yes, sir. Mr. Nevarez? Thank you for sharing this. Um, extremely important. Drastic change if we just do our part. Mayor, we have a speaker for this item, Miriam Cruz. Um, I wanted to mention the, um, I wanted to mention a couple of things, but one, I'm hoping the city can provide um, that, 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 whatever was just passed out um, to the public as soon as possible, rather than waiting for the minutes to get um, typed up. Um, by Mr. Um, Nevarez's expression, it seems that it's very telling and important, and so I'm hoping that you guys can share that on social media or on the website as soon as possible. Um, and also, I have more of a question about um, the backup that was provided under that item, Resolution 615. Um, towards the end, I believe it's number, six, number, seven, number eight. Um, number seven, actually, the declaration authorizes the city to suspend, modify any order, regulation, rule, procedure, policy, or city covenant to which the city is a part to. Um, I was wondering how that applies to any of the planning and zoning um, regulations. I know that the planning and zoning uh, meeting was canceled on Tuesday, and I'm not really sure how the city plans to move forward with all the developments that are, that are happening, all of the um, applications that are being submitted. Um, I'm wondering if anyone in the room can provide um, more some information on that. And also, since we have this gentleman who um, I didn't catch the title is there, I wonder if he would um, tell the city how important it is for city council members to maybe sit a little more farther apart than they are right now. Um, he's like supposed to be six feet away so doing social distancing. Just a thought. Thank you. Ms. Villalobos? Um, just first of all, I know I'm coughing, but uh, it's allergies. It's just really allergies. I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. Been to the doctor a couple of times already. Um, and Ms. Miriam, we weren't able to understand very much what you were saying because it sounded kind of muffled. But I think uh, you were talking about the planning and zoning department that did not have their meeting. And I would just suggest just call Mrs. Uh, Rodarte tomorrow and uh, she can update you on that. Mr. Duran? And looking at these, um, at these charts and graphs and everything, it's not a matter of when or if we're going to get hit with this. It's a matter of when. And I think the more we do now today, the less, if we can get to that 75% where we get less people infected. But if, we, if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, and we see, you know, 406 people infected. So we need to do as much as we can today so that we, it's not, a like I said, it's not a matter of if it's going to hit Socorro. Everybody's hoping, no, it won't hit us. It's going to hit us. And what we do is going to matter, is going to mean whatever, how many people get hit with this. What we do today and what we do not only today, but from now on is going to, is going to say how many people are going to be infected. And hopefully, anybody that does get infected will recover, and we won't have any loss of life. Mayor, this is Jim Martinez. Can you hear me? Yes. You're there. Uh, Mayor, yeah, I am. Uh, for this item, we have, I don't think you need to take any specific action on this item at this time. I would suggest convening now in inside this meeting convening the emergency meeting that we posted a separate notice for um i don't know if all if the entire council notice but we did post an emer emergency excuse me a notice of an emergency meeting 
to adopt an ordinance which extends the disaster declaration for 30 days. Under the Open Meetings Act, there are provisions for emergency meetings and emergency notices on as little as one hour notice, and we posted it today, and we posted the proposed ordinance. The proposed ordinance that we've distributed simply extends the local disaster declaration that the mayor already signed, because that, that unilateral declaration is limited to seven days, and the ordinance would extend it for 30 days. The city of El Paso passed a similar ordinance on Tuesday. So then at this time, should we call the emergency item next? Yes, ma'am, it's actually, it's actually noticed as a separate meeting. I would simply convene, call that meeting to order without adjourning this meeting. You'll, you'll, be, op you'll be opening a second meeting, so there'll be two meetings occurring at the same time. So it's a, like a sub-meeting or okay. meeting within a meeting. So at this time? A meeting within a meeting. At this time, at 646, we are calling the emergency meeting to order, and we have item number one. Discussion and action on an emergency ordinance of the city of Socorro, Texas, extending a disaster declaration due to a public health emergency. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Uh, just a <clears throat> question on, on protocol. We Mr. Don't Perez. To, we don't need to, uh, thank you, Mayor. We don't need to uh, go through uh, roll attendance, call. roll call or anything like that? Or we no, can we just let the rest. No, sir, you do not. Okay. We've already done. done All so. right. René Rodríguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Pérez? Aye. And Ivan Colombia Lobos? Yes. <clears throat> Mayor, to avoid any confusion, I would uh, request a motion to adjourn the emergency meeting. Motion to adjourn uh, the emergency meeting? Second. René Rodríguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colombia Lobos? Yes. And we adjourn at 647. Back to regular meeting. Going back to our regular agenda, um, we have item number 14, discussion and Thank action. You, Thank you. Thank you. Discussion and action on preliminary plat approval for Villas de Socorro subdivision, being all of tracks 13B and 18, block 12, and tracks 1, 3A, and 3C, block 27, Socorro Grant. From Office of Emergency Management. <coughs> Do we have a motion for item 14? A motion to approve a discussion. Second. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Joe Terrazas, building official. This is a preliminary tap approval for Villas de Socorro subdivision. This subdivision is about 950 feet from Socorro Road. It has approximately 45.79 acres. It'll contain 112 single family lots, two ponding areas, and an open space. Um, we had a public hearing for this preliminary plat on February 18th, 2020. Uh, there was no opposition on the, on the plat. This property is on the southern part of Socorro. This is how the subdivision is proposed. There's still some pending uh, reports that need to be submitted. Uh, we still need to see the soil analysis to determine adequacy of the soil for the proposed construction. <coughs> we need to see a schedule of the development. We still are pending covenants and restrictions. Uh, we also detected on the open space that you see on this area here, uh, there's solid waste, tires, and vegetation. Uh, we're asking for an environmental site assessment, phase two, uh, to assess the actual presence of environmental contaminants. We also are asking for a stormwater maintenance agreement to comply with the MS4 according to section 4477. Uh, based on the trip generation, this subdivision is estimated to generate over a thousand trips. Uh, we're asking for a traffic impact analysis uh, to cover a one and a half mile radius. Uh, on the red line, some of the corrections that are pending. 
we already shared this information with a developer. We're asking for a stub out at the end of this little street uh, to provide access to a property that is landlocked. Also, there is a pending the developer is going to have to purchase a portion of land to avoid uh, an encroachment into the right of way that's proposed. Uh, according to a meeting we had with a developer, he's going to purchase the entire land. He just can't get a hold of the owner. According to this survey, it's Manuel Campos. So one, when, the reason you see those red lines is because he's proposing to purchase the entire land and recap this track to create additional lots. They already purchased this property in the corner. It's gonna be repatted to continue uh, two or three additional lots. This is where the ponding areas are gonna be. We're also asking for, on the original uh, discussion, the developer was talking about creating a, a baseball park, but later uh, on a different conversation, it was determined that the Lower Valley Water District was interested in on those 16 acres. The city doesn't have any plan for those 16 acres, uh, except that it might be transferred to the Lower Valley Water District. And then uh, we're also asking for a special analysis of a- Mr. Rodriguez? <clears throat> Before we, we can continue, on those 16 acres partials, okay? Um, why does the Lower Valley water interested in those? They mentioned that they're looking for some land to establish uh, a facility. So this, we determined that this will be the most appropriate place because it's a centralized location between San Isario, Socorro, and Penn. Okay. So that's the reason why uh, staff is recommending to transfer those the 16 acres to the Lower Valley Water District for their facility. I, I Mr. Perez? A, I do have a question, though. No. Um, and I don't know about <clears throat> how you all feel, but it seems like the ingress and the egress are, is kind of limited to that area. I, I, I don't know. I I see that, uh, that uh, the feeder streets are narrow, it seems like, from here. And I'm not so sure that we have or that that area would be able to handle the increased traffic. Again, that's just me from an unprofessional standpoint that's or that, amateur standpoint. That, that's saying. the reason why we're asking for a traffic impact <coughs> analysis to see if we're going to uh, require that's additional signalization or uh, additional right-of-way or <laughs> property acquisition. Uh, the other report that we're asking is for a special problems analysis because there's an area that seems to be uh, difficult in topography. Okay. Uh, with those uh, reports analyzed, we'll, we should be able to determine if it's feasible. Yeah, because it just seems very compact in there, or like they're very tight. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I don't know, it just, I, it just seems very limited, ingress and egress. <laughs> Mr. Medina? Right. So what is before you, as Mr. Carlos pointed out, is that with the new master plan ordinance that you all approved some time ago, we now have the capability to examine the traffic impact analysis. And based on the analysis, the body has the capability to outright deny the, the this, you know, or any type of thing moving forward. So the, the department to include the, the planning and zoning commissioners have recommended to move forward on this. However, it's at your discretion to deny this if there's any, uh, I would say, uh, I guess ultimately we, we have technical things that still need to be answered mm -hmm. by the developer. And so it could be denied or postponed until such, uh, or we can move forward again. I, I would recommend. Ms. Velos? Um, he brings up two good points. Um, we also have to think about um, the landlock, right? There's, a, there's one person out there, but they're, they're willing to uh, leave that lot open so they the person can come in and out correct or is one is it one just one resident it's only one property that belongs to the city of El Paso mm -hmm. uh, the engineer says that there's connection to uh, Flor Preciosa however you can see the way this property is padded uh, we don't consider this sufficient access for the property 
uh, you have approximately uh, between 15 and 20 feet uh, connection to flow of Preciosa. That's the reason why we're asking for an additional stub out uh, to provide connectivity to the subdivision. And then I don't see anything about a park for this subdivision. The park is, that's the reason why the developer is asking to uh, donate or give away the 16 acres uh, in lieu of the park. Hmm. So that we can do that. Yeah. There's six, the 16, they need, the lower valley needs 16 acres. No, if I may clarify, mm -hmm. is that we had this recent discussions with the Lower Valley Water District. And so in that discussion is that with our capital improvement programs that we're jointly moving forward with is that we're sharing ideas and we're trying to identify opportunities. So obviously this body hasn't been approached, neither has that body been approached about this potential uh, facility for them. Uh, one of the options that the developer has is to one, either build a park uh, that would be equal to the amount of the living area the other is to pay the fee or the other one is that we just don't accept the 16 acres so those are the three options that are on the table and those get, those are the only options those are the three options that, that, that but that there could be other options if if somebody came up with something else absolutely yes, okay mr Duran? i i think we need to before if we if we were going to move forward we need to address all these items of how we're going to get people in there and out there, how we're going to do with the park, because that land, um, you know, they give it to us and then we're responsible for it. Whereas if they, you know, they're responsible for putting in a park. So we need to, we need, I think we need to postpone until we get all the information from this builder on how they're going to correct the problems of, you know, getting in and getting out how they're going to handle the uh, the park problem and how they're going to keep that person from being landlocked. Ms. Yalavas? I think um, a park the size of this community, how much are we looking at? I don't think we're looking much. It, it said 1.5, 1. 1. point something. The area required for park is 1.15 acres according to the size of the land. That, so, that would be two and a half percent. So let's say the, the, the lower valley water uh, uh, is granted maybe 15 and a half, wouldn't that be sufficient for the water, lower valley water? Do you think, or, you know, do well, you well, know? Again, and I must emphasize is that this is discussions between administrations. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been any type of analysis on their end to see if their body would accept such a facility, the amount of this size. But like Mr. Carras has pointed out is that in our brainstorming is that we wanted to locate an area that would be centric to the entire region since they do provide a lot of service to a lot of the abutting communities. Um, and so we felt that this is one opportunity that both this body and their body could capitalize on providing a greater service to the entire community. Again, there are no engineering uh, specifications out there that I reviewed or that we've required them to uh, impose on them. Something that comes to mind is definitely we're, I think as a council here, we agree that the parks are very important to our, to our communities, that our new com communities that are coming up uh, for quality of life, number one. And number two, is there any other land that they can purchase that's around there that can give them more, you know, that we can, that they can combine? I'm just saying, thinking out loud. Okay. I don't think, uh, so they, they had come to the city asking for any type of property that we have. And really, the use that they want for this is a recycling center. Uh, they had purchased some land that they were not able to rezone. Uh, Clint did not allow them to. Mm -hmm. So I know that that's something that they've been looking and trying to work with us to do a recycling center and make sure that people recycle. And when this came up, we had a meeting, and this was uh, pitched. And, you know, that's why we're, we're having this conversation. But if that's not something that you all are interested in, we can go ahead and postpone. Mr. Nevanas? Do we know why Clint wouldn't allow it? They just didn't want to rezone. Um, our understanding is just that they have a small town mentality and didn't want to, a recycling center in their backyard. And I do know that we're outgrowing our recycling center, um, so we would combine 
our services to provide to our community because we are tremendously getting, I, I mean, every weekend when we open up on Tuesday, we have tons and tons of recycling use for it. Mayor, we have two speakers for this item. Miriam Cruz. I think they can. Yes. Well, yes. Ms. Okay. Cruz? Um, yes. Hello? Go ahead. Can I go ahead? Okay. So I wanted to um, emphasize, and I'm really happy that the traffic impact analysis is um, listed in the staff recommendations, but I also want to thank uh, Mr. Duran for talking about potentially postponing this item not sure how the council feels about postponing until actually all of the items that are discussed um, from staff recommendations and including whatever talk the administration seems to, you know, figure out or hash out how that people um, believe this postpone. I also wanted to talk about how the preliminary plan is approved but yet the encroachment and the egress and decrease and the traffic impact analysis isn't necessarily fixed or addressed, especially since the encroachment problem relies um, on the fact of him actually being able to purchase uh, the property, which is not a done deal, how that might be an issue down the line. Um, also, I wanted to mention that I know Mr. Terraza, um, and he does a great job, but I know he mentioned that there is no opposition for that subdivision, but that subdivision, when it was presented in the planning and zoning um, meeting, it was presented with baseball parks being there, um, and, 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 and that idea was, was you know, discussed. And so there might not have been a opposition then, but now there might be with this new information as it develops. Also, I wanted to ask whether- Ms. Cruz, your time is up. Parks and ponds to be separated um, from the- Ms. Cruz, your time is up. Ricardo Felix. Ricardo Felix is the engineer who's working on the on the reports and on this update. The other uh, engineer is uh, Robert Romero. He's on the line. Uh, Ricardo Felix is on the line. Engineer who's working on the on the report and on this operation. The other uh, engineer is uh, Robert Romero who's on the line. Uh, Ricardo Felix is on the line. Engineer who's working on the. Okay. Sir, can you uh, lower Turn your volume uh, of the live stream that you're watching so that we won't get feedback? Yes, uh, Mr. Olguin. No, this is Ricardo Felix. Okay, Ricardo Felix, um, go ahead. You can. Yes. Do you have any comments, sir? Can you hold just a second, please? Okay, so I think we should, um, some of these comments were not uh, uh, TNZ, so maybe I think the best idea would be to postpone the item. Um, just to answer a few questions, there are two egress and ingress um, locations to support to the subdivision. Uh, there's also another one, a future to the city of San Diego. So that's going to be a total of three different ways for you for, for the residents to to come in and out and out of the subdivision. Also, um, as for the parcel being landlocked, um, Mr. Escobar is fine with, like 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 Joe said, Mr. Mr. Escobar is fine with um, providing the park or that that open space that can eventually be. Uh, egress or ingress location for that parcel with city of El Paso in the north. Mr. 
Nani Martinez. AT&T. Nope. Mr. Felix? Yes. So, so there's, there's multiple ways for us to, to give uh, that, that parcel that needs landlord uh, access instead of doing that stuff that, that Joe business is asking for. Your time is up. What was nope. the motion, Ms. Navarro? The motion is to approve. Uh, Mr. Perez, seconded by Ivan Colombia Lopez. Okay, so at this time, if I may, I'd like to uh, rescind my previous motion and uh, make a motion to postpone until such time that the technical questions are addressed by the developer, along with all the other studies uh, and analyses that are required by the city. Mayor and Council, let me uh, just make you aware that this uh application has a time limit uh, we only have 30 days to act on it uh, because uh recommendation from the finance zoning commission was made on february 18th it's important that we need to uh, take action on it today today is the last day that we have uh, there's only three options either approve approve with conditions or deny that's part of the new state law mr rodriguez <clears throat> Okay, I just I just need someone to answer this question. Uh, just make the okay. Um, make the assumption that if we deny this application, but the reason why is because we don't want it to take action on itself. Because remember, if we don't take action, the state says that automatically it becomes uh, approved. Okay, so. If we take action to deny so that we can go back to the table, per se, and and uh, get some resolutions on all of the items that were that were asked. Um, does he have to pay another fine? I mean, does he have to pay another or it's just subsequently just come and resubmit it? That's part of the recommendation that staff provided. It's on the report uh, contingent to the approval of all those reports. So we still need to analyze the reports before they're allowed to uh, break ground. Uh, and it does say there that it's contingent upon the submittal and approval of the reports before the construction begins. Mr. Medina, what would happen if we were to deny today? So under state law is that we have to define the technical things that it was denied for. Mr. Terrassa and the uh, backup has uh, informed the entire public. So from there, there was 10 days for him to come back or the developer to come back and respond to that. Mr. Duran? Yeah. Jim? Yes, ma'am. Mayor, the, the city manager and city planner have it are correct. I think the way the statute is structured, Council has identified. Um, I think the way the statute is structured, what it, what it really contemplates is that a preliminary plat is is very different from a final plat. I mean, it's all, there's parts of it that are almost aspirational in nature. My suggestion would be is all the issues that have been raised can be made part of the, part of the conditions on which the approval is, is part of the conditions for approval of the plat, and then. They'll, they'll get worked out by staff, and the, the idea is that once they come back for approval of the final plan, all those issues will have been worked out, and council doesn't have to approve them until they are. Mr. But, but my point is, and therefore I think it's better at this point, to rather than try to deny it, which triggers triggers a long process and puts them back at the start, I think you'd be better off simply making those conditions, simply approving conditionally and then adding all the conditions to discuss. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Duran? Also, um, if it's denied, don't they have to wait another year? No? They can come back right away? No, so <clears throat> under, technically, the answer is yes. But under the requirements under state law is that we have to define the technical deficiencies on why it was denied. So in other words, 
um, they can't break ground until everything that we want if you is addressed. It, yes, sir. If you make it part of the motion to make the prohibition of any construction prior to all these being met satisfactory before this body, that would be the recommendation. Okay, I think I'd like Mr. Perez to add the park in there. Well, I, I'd like to go ahead and make uh, restate my motion to approve upon the conditions uh, are met, but also to add that any, because environmental is being done, that any, any findings be corrected prior to any type of uh, approval, any type of construction. Ms. Villalobos? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would simply specify the conditions that are as part of your motion. Already. So then uh, the the conditions have been um, uh, have the, there are there are part of the staff recommendations and so are noted in the in the backup material. So I'll go ahead and, and um, again restate my motion to approve with the conditions identified by staff and also to make sure that all um, um, results from any analysis environmental or otherwise are rectified and corrected before any ground is broken. Second. Ms. Villalobos? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable ap approving this, even the way uh, Mr. Perez has recommended, only because there's so much still, I mean, there's so much still that this, this plat map needs or this, this project needs and, and we, the city, have to keep track of all those needs. Um, and it's not the only um, subdivision, you know, coming our way or pending. Um, it's just too much work. Um, this should have been a lot more clean and completed before it came to our, uh, for us. Um, because once we, once they go through all that, then, you know, they come back and we don't like something, then, Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Martinez, but because they've spent all this money and they've done all this work, you know, one way or another, it's going to be our, it's going to be, you know, it's going to fall on us because they spent all this money um, when we should have denied it in the first place. So I just think that you, we should think about it because we've been here before. Uh, I'd like to, Mr. Pettis, if you could add the park in there too. Okay, so then I apologize. So I'll add to my my very verbose uh, motion to approve uh, the uh, the preliminary plat with the conditions um, stipulated by staff, and also to um, remediate or to correct any uh, uh, anything from the findings of the environmental and also to look at or to have a park integrated as part of the plat. Sick. Before construction. Does that cover also landlocked? Um... Yes. Yes, okay. Mean, because that was part of the list. All righty. Rene Rodriguez. Aye. Sister Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colombia Aye. Yes. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yes. Item number 15 Discussion and action on the final plat approval for Judiflora subdivision, Unit 1, being all of Tract 5R, Block 78, Section 7, Township 4, Texas and Pacific Railway Service. Do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve. Second. Julie Flora Subdivision is Julie Flora Subdivision Unit One is located outside the city limit. It lies within the two-mile ETJ. Uh, this is the final path. Uh, the only difference 
between the preliminary and the final is that there, there was a recommendation from council on the preliminary pad that they should provide a park. However, the county didn't want the park. Uh, this is information that we couldn't verify with the county, according to the, to the applicant. Uh, the county doesn't want the park here. The reason for that is because this developer is going to uh, extend the subdivision to 90 acres that they own. This is only the, the entrance to the future subdivision. And in the future uh, development area, that's where the park is going to be established. So the county disagreed with the recommendations that were uh, made by council. And it sounds like they didn't want a, a, a park in this phase of the development. Some of the things that we're asking from them is a copy of a draft of the deeds and restrictions for covenants. This is to prevent substandard construction on those lots. Um, according to the applicant, all of these lots have already been negotiated to a builder. So they're not gonna be sold to the public. One of the concerns that the Planning and Zoning Commission had is that in the future, we were gonna see these kind of buildings uh, mobile homes and stuff like that. That's not the case, according to the applicant. All of these lots are going to be developed by a builder uh, that is going to create uh, homes that are similar in, in construction. Um, according to them, they want it to look nice for the future uh, subdivision. Ms. Villalobos? Um, did you say that um, we have no paperwork saying uh, that the county went ahead and denied um, or gave them permission not to put a park or did not we require them to put a park? We, we couldn't confirm uh, what the applicant was telling us. We mm -hmm. tried to communicate with the county. However, nobody wanted to send something in writing, a letter or something from the county saying that they disagreed. Mm -hmm. uh, we never got a confirmation from anybody. Okay. So, um, so we can't verify that. And, you know, we don't we don't, we shouldn't be voting on future, you know, what they think they're going to do in the future. It's what, what, it, if they need that now, if, then we should, if we require parks here, we should require parks everywhere. So, and not, not wait to see what they do in the future. You know, if that's my, um, Mr. Perez. Uh, I understand that it's out in the county because it's, that's where it lays or lies, but I do have a question. Um, or actually two. Do they have uh, access to drinking water? Yes. They do? According to them, the water is provided by the Lower Valley Water District. Okay. Uh, we thought that it was the Horizon mud, mud. but no. It's, okay, but it's, they do have uh, yes. access to municipal water. Okay. That was my question because if we're going to have, or they're going to have on-site wastewater disposal systems and not have uh, drinking water, then the I was just thinking about the sizes of the lot and those kinds of things for uh, making sure that, that they, they address the, the on-site septic tank. Yes, sir. Okay. So with the water uh, connection or, or access to municipal water, then the light, lot sizes aren't, aren't uh, they don't have to be as big or they don't, there's no minimum lot size? No, sir. They, they, uh, they need the acceptable criteria for a lot that's gonna have on-site septic tanks, and they're also gonna have on-site plumbing. They have enough room for... Now, another question. And um, is the developer going to install them, or is the homeowner going to be responsible for doing that? Because at that point, then we're looking at different issues with permits and those kinds of things. According to them, the builder is gonna provide um, all the infrastructure that's necessary for the for okay. the improvements. Yes. Okay. Ms. Villalobos? So here we go again. We have another subdivision where they're gonna do on-site ponding. So, um, how are we, so we have to enforce it once the developer is long gone? That's, uh, I believe that falls under the jurisdiction of the county, not the city. Okay. 
I think we should be a lot more stricter with that as well because it affects it even if, if it falls under the county it affects us anyways because we know that um, they're not going to maintain it and that water is going to run down this way so eventually the, uh, the, the location of this development uh, it's in a low point that makes it impossible for runoff to jump this mountain to flow into Socorro. There is no way. So which way does the water run? The, the grade, mm -hmm. I believe it, it runs towards this way. This is the high point. Mm -hmm. So it kind of goes in a what's, slope. What's that road in? No, there go back. That's Darrington and behind this way, the major road? Uh, temperance. Keep going. No, you're going the wrong way. So go back. Uh, right there, that one. Uh, right the same. there. That's the same. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Perez? The only reason why I bring up the wastewater disposal systems is because that becomes, if they're not attended to, he will notice that it becomes a safety and health hazard. And so if, if uh, they're not done correctly, or if, again, whatever the case may be, that they're um, neglected, then it becomes a, a health issue. Then you start looking into getting into uh, polluting the water table and all those other things that, that we try to get away from colonias. And here we are approving. Mayor, we have a speaker for this item, Miriam Cruz. Hi, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Yes. Um, Vivi, I just took the words out of my mouth. Um, I agree, we should be requiring parks, you know, just like <laughs> we were told that there's gonna be baseball parks out there. We, we get told this fantasy, this, this great idea and and city council and others plans you know usually um buy into it and they think how great how amazing and then it doesn't happen and and, and here we are again i have two questions one i would like to know if mr Carrasos and mr medina could either either of them provide an estimate of what the amount would be of the 2.5 percent that would be paid to the city um and second uh, actually, it's more of a comment. There's no telling how long those residents uh, of, of those that they're going to be building, how long they're actually going to have to wait for a park uh, if they ever get one. Um, there's nothing that requires them to actually build what they're planning to build. And so I'm not really sure why a small park that probably will be very easy to maintain because it'll be small can't be put out there for those residents for, for now and forever. That land will be gone uh, if it's not provided now. Thank you. Mr. Medina? Mayor and Council, uh, Mike Lee, the City Planner. I guess just to reiterate is that this area is in the ETJ. And so with the design standards that we have, the design standards that the county had, they are not congruent. So I would also be uh, worrisome and provide some caution is that in the ETJ, the only authority that we have is to approve the plat and any improvements subject to that plat that are submitted. Uh, so here again, the discussions are the what ifs. The, the what if is that we only know that we can only approve the plat. Uh, enforcement will be negligible at best. So the recommendation here, although it may have been approved uh, for uh, recommendation by the body and by the planning department is to flat out deny it. Mr. Rodriguez. Before I say anything, I'm gonna say this comment. <clears throat> I hate the thought of forcing somebody else for a park because it's not even in our city. I will say it here and I said it many times and I will never back down from this. A park is a big responsibility. You know, if we can't maintain half of our parks, okay, because we're understaffed, because we don't have the budget for it. What makes you think that I am gonna feel comfortable forcing the county in the middle of the boondocks to have a park? 
That's one. Two, um, <clears throat> I don't like the thought about having um, ponding in their facility because time and time again, we've seen it here in Socorro where yes, it's there for six months, seven months after you know people move in and stuff, and then they start covering it up and using the land for whatever purpose they desire because at the end of the day, it's their land. But nevertheless, enforcement, that's the key word right there, enforcement. We have no authority to go out there and enforce. So therefore, what's the big deal? Okay? We need to understand that. You, we need to understand what is our right, what can we do, and what can't we do. So before we go out there and start, you know, dictating to, you know, people out there, out there, is we need to be wary, you know. So at this time, I would like to resent my motion and uh, uh, to deny. Mr. Duran? With on with onside ponding, uh, we're going to have mosquitoes in the summertime, and with all of the new diseases that are popping up, we can't afford to have uh, things like that. Uh, we need to we need to be able to get rid of the water and not have it on site because, like you said, they're not going to take care of it. They're not going to maintain it. It's going to turn into um, a colonia if you will, because of the fact that uh, it's going to be uh, not because nobody has any jurisdiction. The county's not going to go out there, like Mr. Rodriguez said, and we can't go out there. So I do have to agree with Mr. Rodriguez. Um, Mr. Perez? Very quickly, and uh, only because I, I, I think I feel I need to make this clarification. On-site ponding is different from on-site wastewater disposal because on-site wastewater disposal takes engineering in terms of making sure the water percolates, that everything is, everything is uh, as much as possible, all the contaminants are mitigated, those kinds of things. And that's what ends up with uh, uh, roots and weeds growing inside of it and mm -hmm. causing it to, to malfunction. And so that's where it becomes, I think, uh, um, a health hazard. Well, I don't think it does become a health hazard for those in, in those area, those individuals living in that area. And I think, and I'm glad that Mr. Rodriguez changed his motion because I don't think I could uh, endorse a, a plat or <clears throat> a subdivision that is not in the 21st century. I understand that uh, there are plenty of households in other parts of the US with uh, the uh, on-site water disposal systems but at this point, given the fact that we haven't had a very good history with areas uh, of that sort, I couldn't endorse having that in our backyard, literally. That would be in the backyard. Ms. Um, you know, um, and, and I thank you, Mr. Medina, for you know, letting us know what we can and cannot do. I think we need to change that in the future, what we can and cannot do, because it affects us tremendously. So why, why bring it here? if you're limiting to what we can do and cannot do. So we need as a council to think about that and talk to the county because when it comes to we need funds from the county to fix and correct stuff like this, it's very hard to get funds to help us. So un unless they're going to take care of the issues that it's gonna come with in the future, I think we should go to the county and uh, find out, you know, and Mr. Uh, Martinez, I don't know, is it a state is it a state rule or is it uh, an interlocal uh, agreement of what we can and cannot do? I'm, I'm not sure I understood the question. Is it a state move or is, did you say state move? Is it, a, is, it, is it a Texas law, what we can and cannot do, or is it something local here with, within the county? You mean, you mean, well, there are state law controls the extent of our jurisdiction in uh, of our authority in the ETJ, but ultimately, if it is count, if it is in the county, there's a lot of ways you could. There, there's a lot of ways you could modify that or specify that if you do have an agreement with the county. Okay, 
because more and more I, I, I see that our hands are tied because of, you know, what we can and cannot do. And, and uh, maybe we should uh, bring them up to the 21st century. Thank you, everyone. Rene Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalobos? Yes. Item number 16, discussion and action to proceed with acquisition of properties for North Nevada's roadway realignment. Motion to approve for discussion. Second. Mayor. Ms. We would uh, like to request that we can go into executive session for this item. And it's okay, we move it to the end of the meeting. Um, but it, it's all up Mayor. to Mayor. Mr. Martinez? Yeah, yes, I would, if you're going to, if the council wishes to go into executive session, I would make part of the motion that it is to consult with your attorneys and to deliberate regarding real property. Wait, but we can move it to the end of the. So yeah, I'll, we'll move it. I'll go ahead and receive my, my motion. And uh, if we can go ahead and at this point just entertain the motion to move agenda item number 16 till the end of the meeting before adjourning. Second. And, to, and, and, uh, and uh, discuss it in executive session. Second. Rene Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalobos? Yes. Item number 17, discussion and action to approve an interlocal agreement for the provision of professional engineering services to El Paso County from the city of Socorro. Motion to approve for discussion. Second. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Mike May, uh, city planner. Um, there were some discussions early on with the county uh, and also to include the city of El Paso. Oh. Oh, I just remember what it was. Sorry. That's why it, it, it that's why it, it threw me off, Mayor. Sorry about that. I just remembered what it is. Okay. So in the, the cooperative effort between the three bodies, there was a discussion about having uh, a re-examination of our design standards. So the idea was to have a homogeneous component that whether you're in El Paso, in the city of Socorro, or even in the county, that the design standards are homogeneous or the same. Uh, recent conversation with the county is that we do understand that the city of El Paso is moving forward on their own accord. And so my discussion with their planning director at the county is that we felt that our engineering services would fit the bill uh, to allow not only the county to move forward on the design center where the uh, commissioners have uh, awarded this project uh, half a million dollars. Uh, it would also give us the capability to not only re-examine our standards but also have the same standards in the etj that we just talked about moreover is that it would also help the neighboring municipalities that do not have the capacity to have professional engineering or planning services so the idea here is that there's an illustrative list that we would have that we be examining uh, from subdivision from etj uh, you name it it's complete yes, sir. mr Mina, um and I like the idea, but having worked in a previous career with, uh, not with the county, but along with in certain projects, um, it's the, the standards for construction, the standards for subdivisions, um, they were not at par with the municipalities. And it almost seemed intentional because that way, the, the less they had, the less they had to worry about. And so that was that was my perspective. I could be totally off. And so I'm just hoping that in, in this interlocal that they are willing to abide by whatever um, we identify as shortcomings or in terms of uh, aligning and having the same type of uh, expectations when it comes to building, construction, uh, road building, and those kinds of things, and, infra and other infrastructure. Yes, sir. And duly noted, and I think that's why we decided to have that conversation. Okay. Where we felt that, uh, as a matter of fact, when I first came on board, the first assignment I had was to examine a particular subdivision that was being developed in the ETJ. And so we do know that uh, the lesser restriction is at the county. Mm -hmm. And again, for everybody's knowledge here is at the, at the county, 
they also did not have the capability of zoning. Right, didn't have right? enforcement. And so we felt here that if we are able to move forward is that the design standard uh, that we have is what we enforce. Again, so the example here is that part of the, the, uh, the examination is to create uh, a committee and this committee would be seated by every participant at the municipal level. So we would have uh, Anthony, we would have uh, Horizon, we would have Clint and et cetera. And so for example, if Clint wanted to adopt something a little bit different, then they can do that. But the idea is that we would have a, at least a baseline of something that would be homogeneous that we can you know, migrate in and out. So it becomes a seamless approach of the design. And, and again, I just want to clarify, not so much the county was was like, to your point about uh, the lack of being able to uh, have uh, ordinances or the ordinance uh, capability by the county. What I meant is at the state level, it seems like the state by almost by intent, it keeps those properties or the properties out in counties bare, uh, with the bare minimum. Uh, with the bare minimum. Exactly. And so, uh, and, that, and again, going back to Colonias, that's what promulgated the, the situations with Colonias that uh, they were out in the county, and there weren't there weren't any any, any there wasn't anything to be able to to effectively enforce, uh, uh, you know, some kind of restrictions on. Correct. Yes, sir. Mr. Rodriguez. Yeah, and and in talks, um, that's what we were we were talking about for a while now. Is that we wanted to streamline everything in the county so that it, it because they do not have zoning uh, in it, they can't really do what we as municipalities can. If we were to start at a platform and say, hey, this is what we're going to across the board, then Saneli, Clint, Fabens, uh, Tornillo, uh, Anthony, Socorro, and, and in between spaces in the county, are going to be able to say, hey, if you're going to build a house here, well, the standard's going to be all across. And that's what we're trying to do so that in the future, if we decide to to annex portions of, of, of uh, neighborhoods, per se, um, at least those homes will already be up to code. And that's what we want to do is that we want people to be able to have safer uh, homes out in the out in the uh, outskirts of the cities so this is, is something not only great for us but it's going to be great for the county and the greater good for the whole county of El Paso. Agreed. Well, Mary, if I may just elaborate on, on some of the elements that are uh, in the scope of work is that we will be looking at the dedication construction requirements um, and the city participation the ETJ standards water, wastewater, utilities, roadways, street lighting, driveways, traffic impact analysis, stormwater management requirements, park and open space, sidewalks, fire lanes and fire department access, easements, block, lot design and improvement standards. Uh, this doesn't apply to us, but we have the mountain development area uh, and any additional requirements for postal delivery, for example. Uh, alternative subdivisions, smart code, things of that nature, uh, drainage design standards, landscaping, and of course, construction design standards. Would that include, well, addressing, I guess, um, like, because that's also been very, so, so a tenuous subject in terms of um, a subdivisions out in the county where you didn't have a good addressing system for 911 services. And those kinds of things and so the, all that will also be incorporated or work yes sir okay and i think here to add is that since the commissioners uh, were very generous in giving half a million dollars uh, to have skin in the game uh, what we're also asking is twenty five thousand dollars to contribute to this effort yeah i'm not interested, I'm interested. So I guess so I'll, I'll include my motion to include the $25,000. Did I make the motion? You, you had made the motion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was me. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I knew this was coming. I just forgot. Okay. And then I thought, oh, my God. All right. So if I may add to my motion for approval, 
uh, the expenditure of $25,000 as a contribution or assistance in, in the development of this project. Thank you. Seconded by Ms. Cola. No, it was, it was Mr. Um, Nevarez. Mr. Rodriguez. Oh, who, did you second it? No, I thought it was you. I'm sorry. I heard you. And we do have a speaker for this item. Miriam Cruz. Hello? Hello. Hello? Hi, no comment. Thank you. You guys answered all my questions. Thank you. Rene Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colombia Lobos? Yes. Item number 18 Discussion and action on City of Socorro's interest in acquiring property located at 9967 Alameda, Socorro, Texas, 79927. Make a motion to approve. Good evening, Mayor Council, Adriana Rodarte, City Manager. We were approached by the county on February 13th. The county owns a mobile home park within the city of Socorro City limits. It is named SNS Mobile Home Park at 9967 Alameda. The county inherited the mobile home park through a tax lien with the Sanchez family. State law prohibits the county from being a landlord. Therefore, they are preparing to sell that park a private to a private individual who has also a tax lien. Before we negotiate, before they want they negotiate, they want to ask the city of Socorro if we have any interest in acquiring this mobile home park. Information they wanted to share with us is the county inherited the mobile home park from a family who put it down as collateral and then closed their bond business, which means the county took over land in 2018. The commissioner's court has decided that the county does not want to be in the property rental business. The county is doing a land survey and appraisal of the land and is anticipating to sell, uh, selling it. There are seven families living there right now. Most of the families have been at the park for 20 years, which means they cannot pick up their homes and move them, as we think the majority of those trailers would collapse if moved. Ms. Veloz? How much are we talking about if purchased by the city? They haven't uh, done a survey or an appraisal. Mm -hmm. So that would come before you after. It's just, are, are we interested in, in that type of property? You would have to relocate those seven families if we were to purchase. It would, it would be on us. Would you please just, what are the landmarks there? I, I, as much as I travel Alameda, Oh, it's in between the, the car wash and, and, and it's by Rio Vista, but it's, it's, no, no, it's on no. the side. Right. So if you examine the, the closest intersection is Alameda Avenue um, and North Moon. Mm -hmm. So um, that's Vista right there. Yes, yeah. sir. So that's the, the, uh, the supermarket. That's Ronnie, sir. But what used to be Ronnie's service station. Yes, yeah. sir. So this is the area that is highlighted. Um, as the city manager had alluded to, is that we do have residents that live there. Um, it would be upon the city if uh, the body decides to move forward with the acquisition uh, is either to have them in place or to relocate them. Uh, unless otherwise is noted is that I believe that we would have to acquire and establish a public use okay. for such a thing. Um, at this point, when the city manager had asked me to examine the probability of a public use. Um, I don't believe that there's any stormwater collection service that would uh, address uh, Alameda State Highway 20. So essentially is that when this roadway was built, I don't know that there was specific stormwater uh, capability at the time. So I approach it from, from that angle is that if we were to establish a public use, we could essentially build a pond. Uh, however, moving forward is that, as the city manager has pointed out, is that to potentially relocate them may not be in the best interest of the city. But on, if I may, on the flip side, if we are looking at um, mobile homes that would disintegrate upon moving, are we not endorsing substandard housing if we were to become the owners of, of that property? We would become, in essence, land, uh, 
landlords, but uh, slum lords. So, yeah. so you know what? That's true. Right. So there, but, there are provisions in the code that that do allow them to continue to live there. Right. I understood. Understood. Uh, and so I, I would certainly say is that uh, I guess there's two options: is that if we were to go in there, uh, is to examine that. The other thing is that maybe the, the another potential buyer may evict them. Right. And they could be in the same situation as we would be. I, I don't know. Man. So did we already, Mr. Rodriguez? So did we already look into the possibility of what we could do with this property, and did we already make up our mind to say, you know what, it's going to be not cost effective, or it's not in the city's best interest? So, from a planning perspective, is that we do not have any estimates. Uh -huh. um, when the city manager had asked me to examine it, it was from a perspective of trying to mitigate the storm water obviously when it rains there the, if the water does collect and so i think that in establishing the public necessity we could do that by having the pond area um we would certainly have to coordinate with text dot on such a project and i think that takes up may be a willing partner to help the the care uh, the cost sharing but again i we haven't communicated with the district engineer uh but if that were the, the, the approach, I think that we would still need to understand the appraisal from the county, um, what the terms would be. Uh, we would have to go out there and specifically talk to the residents by relocation. Uh, so this is something very similar uh, back uh, when the city of El Paso had to relocate people when they had the 2006 mm -hmm. uh, storm. So it's the same thing is that you're going in there and you're going to purchase property uh, and, and ultimately, is that you're condemning them? Right. I was just. Mr. Perez. You know how we've spoken about uh, the extension of Nuevo Hueco Tanks Road. Um, I'm not sure if this property would help in that future endeavor, or if it could be used for. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's too far. Is it too far? I, I get, and I'm just yes, sir. So, so just for reference, is that this is uh, where we have the new facility, no local tanks. Um, we did submit to the El Paso MPO a project that would start from North Loop and it would find its way down to Alameda. We do not have the preferred alignment yet. Uh, my understanding is that Texas is doing a feasibility study that would help us try to locate that, what we would call the local preferred alternative. And then there our uh, engineer Danabaum would carry the torch for us to finish the environmental document and get the full funding from the MPO. In its entire, the project would go from North Loop and would terminate somewhere out here connecting to the future border highway east. But in terms of the vicinity, I, I think it's a, it's a it's a far off approach. Okay. At this time, I'll resent my motion and deny. Second. Mayor, we have a speaker for this item, Miriam Cruz. Hi, um, I'm not sure you guys can hear me, but I couldn't really hear you guys. Uh, I'm not sure where the phone is set it uh, for set. I'm not sure if some of you aren't speaking into your microphone. Uh, it was really, really, really hard to listen. Now that I'm only listening through my phone, uh, no longer listening to my laptop. So I think that's something to take into consideration in the future for those of us that, for those people who may not be listening in through the live stream, but don't through the phone. Um, I'm going to ask maybe a very stupid question because I, I'm not sure it was answered. Um, I couldn't really hear the discussion. So um, when I was reading the backup, I saw something about ponding area. And I really uh, don't know if it was meant as ponding area that, you, that the city would take over the entire lot and use it as ponding or that funding is required for, I guess, the lot and its size. Um, not sure 
everyone to answer my question. I'm not sure I'll be able to hear your response, but I, I guess I can stay back later on tonight. Thank you. Can you hear us, Ms. Miriam? I'm sorry? Oh, it was, uh, this is Ms. Uh, Colombia Lopez. I'm sorry, Ms. Mayor. Ms. Um, I, I think um, well, just so you can hear, um, uh, I believe we're going to deny the item. Um, uh, we were trying to think of ways to use it, but I, I don't think um, at this time we want to pursue something like this. Uh, and I'm saying this because we haven't voted yet. René Rodríguez? Aye. Cicero Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Pérez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalo? Yes. Item number 19, discussion and action to approve credit of liquidated damages incurred through the Onion Field Project. Make a motion to approve. Second. Good evening, Mayor and Council, uh, City Manager Adriana Rodarte. Uh, the reason we're approaching you is the contractor from the Onion Field. Um, part of the contract was if they didn't complete by the end of the completion date of the contract, they would incur liquidating damages. They have, and because we've had some multiple weather days throughout this, uh, since they started the ponding area, the ponding area started April 18th, 2019. The scheduled completion date was December 13th. They did not complete it till February 21st. That is 43 days late. At $600 a day, that would be a balance of 25,800 for the liqu liquidating days. They are asking for, so the engineers are recommending, which is a project manager, for 28 days of um, credit. Leniency? I'm sorry? No, leniency. it's not leniency. No. No. Mr. Rodriguez? Mayor, um, may, may I say this? Okay. In layman's, in layman's terms is when you have a project, when you have a project and you say, hey, I'm going to go work through, uh, let's just say winter, right? and your scope of work in days is gonna take 150 days. Half of that, those days are gonna start in winter, right? So there is a provision in your contract that states that if it starts to rain, you have to stop, you're automatically given that day, an extension, and you add it, say if you have 150 days, now you have 151 days. And then if you miss another day, then you add it and it's 152 days. You see what I'm saying? So everything that stops you with the weather, with bad weather, it, it adds on to the to the end of the your contract date. So you start adding one day, two day, whatever you're missing days, you add them at the end. Therefore, you're you're still with your time because you're just giving, and that's the credit that they're asking. No. So part of the contract did not have that verbiage okay, that then you that's just explained. That's what I'm asking. And that is why they owe the city. $25,800 because they didn't foresee so many weather days, right? So they're 43 days late. Uh, the project manager is saying that if we can credit them for 28 days, they would still pay a 15 uh, day um, what could you fine, which is $9,000. Ms. Elos? Um, it's not in the contract. They're not uh, amateurs. It should have been in the contract. They should know what they're getting themselves into, obviously. And how are we, have we tracked it, you know, those days? Did it rain? Did, are we sure that it did rain? Yes, that's what the project manager is actually in charge of. And they're the ones that are vouching and saying, well, 28 days of credit because they weren't expecting. I mean, and the weather has changed tremendously from last year to this year. I mean, oh, we're we, talking we've about seen February. a very wet... We've been, we've seen a very wet 2020. Right. And if it's a, as a, a record. Go ahead. Right. If it might expand on the city manager's uh, statement is that when we put this uh, project out uh, for a request is that it was noted um, and verbalized and communicated with 
the vendor, the construction company, is that there were no weather days permitted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a huge risk when any vendor comes in and is demonstrating a construction project like this. So obviously, uh, as it's been noted, we have had a very unusual wet season. Uh, but the but ultimately is that when the, the the contract is put out and we have the request for proposal is that it was not allowed. So ultimately is that due to the weather, they were delayed on completing the project. Therefore, any delay to include weather uh, is that they are penalized every day. In this case, it was uh, $600. $600. So again, is that if one of their machinery broke down, uh, people decided not to come to work, that doesn't fall on the city. The expectation as it is identified in the contract to include the schedule that is provided by the vendor uh, has to be met. And I get it. I completely get it. Um, how does how how has this affected the city financially? The, the being um, delayed. It hasn't. Okay. Are we going to do an RQ for the second, the next phase of the onion field, or are, are is the same? Uh... So ultimately, is that in, in later presentation, I'll give a summary of the entire Sparks of Oil project, and we would actually go out for another RFP to conduct these two. Mr. Perez? So for my own clarification, the um, the project manager, well, okay, the company the, the owes us, or owes the city $25,800 for missed work because they did not comply with the contractual obligation of completing the, the project, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so in that, and this is where I got lost. Who is asking for nine thousand dollars instead of the twenty? Who is no the contractor? The contractor went to and is requesting us to come to council and provide them credit on the liquidating damages that the city has incurred because they did not complete the contract at the estimated date or at the end of the date of the contract. So the contractor's coming back and saying, please have mercy on me. We didn't complete it. It's been a wet. Uh, we weren't okay. expecting so many weather days throughout this project. Right, okay. if, if I may expand sure. on that. It, is please. that we, through our engineer, Danabom, we had a meeting and there was a discussion about liquidated damages. So we asked our, um, manager on a recommendation and that's a recommendation that is before you okay uh there was a discussion also with the vendor and he said certainly if there's any mercy as the city manager put it uh that they would be favorable to that so ultimately the options are here is that the body can certainly deny the request uh minimize the request or approve the request I also want to um, add is that we're not completed with this project. So what we do today may affect the bidders that come after this, right? Because we're not completed with, with the request and, and it's a $10 million project. Uh, and we've just did what, three fourths of the project. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this is not a big, I'm sorry, I apologize, okay. but this is not a big drop in the bu bucket of for them if we're talking about a project of that scale. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with him. They're not, am number one, they're not amateurs. Number two, I'm sure that they added in there uh, at least 10 days of, of rainy weather and it hasn't rained all day long except the past couple of weeks and I tell you because my horses are swimming in it. So when you tell me that it has rained, it, yeah, we have had sprinkles here and there, not like the last two weeks. The last two weeks have been uh, raining day and night and skip a day and then another day. Um, but they're not amateurs. They should have been prepared for this. And if anybody wants to come and bid, we have a 10 million project. Uh, I don't think anybody for 25,000 is going to step away or, you know, so we shouldn't be afraid. I, Mr. Perez? I, I just think that on the flip side of that, it, I think as far as setting precedent that if we say, oh no, well, we'll, we'll cut you the slack. 
and we'll allow the nine thousand dollars. That's where I think Adriana is, is is saying that we open the doors to future contract. If something happens, they'll cut the slack for us. And so I think that this is one of those things where and it will happen. Uh, this is unfortunately, and, and this is the price of doing business, mm -hmm. and and it's just not favorable to them at this point. That's, that's all it is. Do we want to resend the motion? Was it me? No. Mr. Uh, in Ms. Colombia, Villalobos made the motion, okay. and Mr. Perez seconded. I resend my motion I, to what deny. To approve? It was to approve. To approve, to deny. I resent, and I will say it to deny 100%. No, no, wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, is it, was, it a, was it to approve the 25,800? Correct? Oh, wait. Mm -hmm. To approve the credit of the liquidating damages, which you are not. So you're denying. Okay. Damages. Okay. Right. All right. All right. Good. Thank you for the question. And not provide any type of credit. They need, they need to stick to the. Okay. Do we have a second? Mm -hmm. Do we have a second? Second. Mr. Rodriguez? We didn't set, the, we set the date, correct? Yes, sir. It was explicit in the contract that there would be no weather days. I just want to I just want to point that out it, it doesn't matter if they said or had contingency plans no it we said it we told them and so it doesn't matter all I'm saying is if I were to do it I'd have those provisions and we need to really think about those because the thing is is that our future when we go out for future bids okay and we don't have provisions like that then we will run into a shorter amount of people who want to do it because of that. Because if we're being stringent and saying, hey, this is the, um, the date you got to take, you see what I'm saying? It's not like they can say, oh, okay. But they could have negotiated that. Exactly. No, no, I know that's what I'm saying. We can I mean, with that's what I'm saying. We have, to, we have to look at it when it comes to it. I mean, I'm not saying mm -hmm. it wasn't in the... Like I said, I work for DJ contractors, mm -hmm. so I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When yes. when I say hey, so it goes back to the same thing. If it wasn't, I thought it was. Mm -hmm. I thought that's what they were trying to do. Now it figures that no, it wasn't. So we won't. Yeah. And this was stated initially. Yeah. So it was. I didn't see the contract. So. Yes, sir. Mayor, and, we and have I, a speaker. Guess, before we go into into the comments, is that for clarification, is that. We did use the text doc template uh, for construction. So certainly uh, when we release the next one, we'll inquire about the uh, weather base. Mm -hmm. okay. Rene Rodriguez? Don't we have a speaker? I'm sorry. No, we don't. We don't. Okay. I'm sorry. For denial, correct? Not to approve right. the credit. Yes, Denied. for denial. Okay. Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colón Villalobos? Aye. Item number 20, discussion and action to approve second proposal phase for the Onion Fields Parks Arroyo project. <laughs> Motion to approve discussion. Second. So, Council, what, what you see uh, before you is the overall uh, system as we're approaching it uh, with regard to uh, containing the stormwater as it relates to the infrastructure that we have in place. So, as we all know that the, as we call it upstream, the water is coming from north of I-10, um, and then it goes through a fluvial component uh, that we call channels. And ultimately, what you see there in the light green would be the detention basin um, at the uh, Stockyard Roadway. From there, the water would also go through another, another fluvial channel and ultimately end up in the onion field. Uh, so as the city manager alluded to, is that this is a over $10 million project in its entirety. Um, before you is the Phase two of the Onion Field Basin, which is estimated at over $1.7 million. 
Uh, we're expecting to excavate uh, a lot more in terms of the cubic yards that exist in that dirt. Uh, and so, I'm sorry, this is a phase uh, two that we just did. Uh, so this also is a coverts on thunder um, and uh, the cubic yards uh, somehow somewhere not here, but ultimately is that this component of the project is complete. The upcoming phase two, uh, I think the other one should have been phase one, is obviously a little bit more uh, expensive. So we're looking at a $3.6 million approach uh, to do this. Uh, we have not written the RFP uh, as it stands or advertised it. Uh, but what is included here is the potential excavation of a lot more uh, dirt. So you can see that we're talking about 240,000 cubic yards of excavation. Uh, and then ultimately is that this would also, uh, we would need to provide a design to the irrigation district to have a, a, uh, a design to capture any potential pollutants that would go into the Mesa drain. Um, but ultimately is that this project would also include inlets uh, that would alleviate the on ponding that occurs that comes from uh, the weather uh, related to when it rains on horizon and the abutting infrastructure. So we would have to essentially put in inlets so that the water would drain away from the structure. Phase three, as it was noted in, in the beginning of the slides, is that it would come uh, as a way of trying to control the water as it comes from Mike 10. So ultimately here, what you see in this very light blue, this meandering uh, component is that this would be a project that would ultimately cost 603,067 cents. Oh, sorry, $7. Yeah, I was looking at it, it didn't look well. Yeah, sorry, it's a long day. Uh, so ultimately is that this would cover from Stockyard to Thunder. So essentially is that as the water is coming from I-10, it would be channeled and they would feed into and be retained there on, uh, on the onion field phase one. Uh, phase four is that now we're moving further into the upstream is that we would need to ultimately not only look at the design again, uh, but this is a project that is estimated at over $4 million. We would also have to develop an inlet uh, and then potentially also require the acquisition of right away. And so these are uh, elements that here we're looking down uh, into the ultimate uh, flow of the water as it approaches. So as you can see that we have a lot of debris, now there's tires, there's things of that nature that ultimately obstruct and would prevent the water from flowing uh, into the inlet and into the onion field, phase one. There's another illustrative component, uh, another one. So, so essentially is that what we're looking at here is the channel that is being recommended to move forward. So at the very edge of that, you could see that we have the onion field and the entrance of the inlets. So one of the things here that it really doesn't cover it, um, and this other one is a little bit more uh, illustrative is that you see all the dirt that is being accumulated into the inlet bed. So as you see, so, so as you can see is that, and, and I believe this is probably the first uh, discussion that we had with, with the vendor in its relationship to the construction. So they, they had asked for a walkthrough so that we can, uh, we can examine if there was any outstanding items. And it so happened that this was uh, an after effect of the first snow that we got. So it, it was taking them a couple of days. They had to bring in machinery from outside. And these culverts are, are pretty small. So there was specialized uh, equipment that had to be brought in and something that we as a city will have to uh, look at in terms of the life cycle, life cycle costs of this project. So as they were going in and removing some of the dirt, uh, there's an illustration there of a gentleman using that equipment. Uh, so first he used a bobcat and then they brought in that specialized equipment on the right hand uh, picture. It 
snowed again. And the culvert was uh, ultimately uh, covered up again. Uh, so, so essentially here is some alternative uh, as it relates to how we approach the project. So in terms of construction costs is that if the body were to direct us to have the development of phase two, this would be the one that is right next to the phase one. We would have to come in and, and do a little bit more is that ultimately we would do the basin, we would do the sparse oil channel or the illustrative elements where we have the tires and things of that nature. Uh, we're looking at a $4.6 million cost. If we were to get the direction to do the channel before we did the basin, uh, ultimately there's a savings of $53,000 and plus. One of the reasons here in our discussion and in the planning work with our engineer is to take an approach where we can capitalize on the removal of the dirt. So ultimately in this other slide where we identify the cost savings is that one of the, I think it's really innovative what we did is that we were able to have partnerships with the public. And we had a lot of people interested in removing the dirt. So we have that in the contract. But more importantly is that we use the, the, the capability of having infill throughout the entire city. So there's other projects that are going on and in lieu of somebody importing the dirt from another area, we allow them to take the dirt that we have there at the onion field and redistribute it to permitted areas. So by doing this, there, there actually was a cost savings to the city as it's illustrated up there. So ultimately here, when we go back to the, the previous slide, and then let me do that, where you see that differential. So the idea of capitalizing on developing the channel would be at a greater cost savings to the city because now we could take that dirt that we have in phase two, compile it so that we can engineer the channel. The channel would be concrete line. And then more importantly is that uh, going back to an earlier, an earlier uh, presentation is that the development of that one presentation where you had 16 acres that were potentially available uh, and if we have the partnership with the Lower Valley Water District, we could also take that cut, the dirt, and transport it over there to those 16 acres and fill it. So ultimately here is that we would be looking at an additional 90,000 cubic yards that would be uh, removed from the onion field and imported into the channel. And then there's a greater savings in still working with the public and removing that dirt and directing them to take it anywhere else. Uh, we also had a conversation with the Lower Valley Water District where they actually came in and also took that. So ultimately here is that you see the design of the channel uh, that, that would come ultimately up from there and then would meander all the way down into uh, Stockyard. Uh, here is a map that is illustrating the owners of set property along the project. Uh, we, the city, do own some of these uh, elements however we do have some private owners to include the county um, and so part of this would be discussions to either ask for easements where appropriate where we could put a covert or ask for the the county in this instance to dedicate it to the city so as you can see here from this illustrative uh, component is that if the county is identified we have the two private properties the three of them um, and if there's any other questions. Ms. De La Voz? Did you say De Alvas? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, heard, I heard De Alvas. Um, I'm all for the savings. I mean, if we're going that route, I'm all the, for the savings. Definitely, because it's a lot of money. And we're not talking about pennies. We're talking about a lot of money. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, spend it all then. <laughs> um, my question is, how does the public 
get a hold of this dirt? Do we, I mean, is it for the public public? Like they go and get it? Or do you guys have tractors there for them to fill up their right. little so, troquitas? So uh, again, is that mm -hmm. because we cannot spend, you know, uh, right. dollars is that, what we do have is that uh, all they have to do is communicate through the city manager or myself mm -hmm. that they're interested in. They do have to find a way to load the the dirt and then transport it. Okay. Just so we could spread the word. But that's what I was asking. Mr. Rodriguez? Um, this project's been here since, oof, since I got here. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Perez... You, you were in discussions with that too back in the day. And this is something that has been coming through the pipeline forever. Um, in discussions with, with commissioners, um, they in principle said that when we were ready to move forward, just to go back to, to them and say, hey, we're ready and then see what they can come up with uh, to, to help us in any way. Um, so with that said, I would like to continue having discussions um, and then I can bring it back to you because I know that our commissioner in our precinct was open to helping us any way he can. And because they do have, because they did help us with the culverts uh, that we did two years ago, two or three years ago uh, from um, I-10 coming down. So they're more than willing to help us out, especially because it's their, their property too. So it's in their interest. Yes, it's in their interest as well. So just uh, FYI. Mr. Perez? So what are we, what is the intent of this agenda item? To ask for more funding, to continue the phases in terms of proposals? What are we looking at? So the, the, the direction and the request here is for actually us to make this the next project. So under the capital improvement program that was presented to you by me and you all approved this some time back, we were actually looking at the phase two uh, as removing the other dirt that exists. So we would actually complete the entire ponding. Uh, but here we felt that because of the opportunity that we've had and the, the success of having the public ultimately come in and take more dirt, I mean, there's this, the cost savings. And then we can also use that same dirt to align the channel so that we can come in and do the concrete lining. So ultimately is that we are moving, if you will, the priority that was set before, but it's still ultimately the Sparks Arroyo project. In terms of the quality of the dirt, because there, is, there has to be of a certain quality to be able to, like if it doesn't have too much clay and all those, all those kinds of things, uh, it would, would it lend itself to allowing that, like if you're gonna do the, the uh, if you're gonna, it's gonna be concrete lined, right? Yes, sir. It would, the, the, there needs to be a certain level of compaction of the dirt to be able to sustain the weight and it wouldn't shift. And so I guess that's my question. Is that dirt in good enough quality to where it would sustain that kind of burden on it? Yes, sir. So we would have those safeguards in place. Okay. So, so ultimately is that if somebody were to come in and say, well, look, I need X amount of cubic yards, right. we can actually restrict on the depth of the dip because obviously the, the further you go down, the better the, the compaction. Right. So that dirt that we would actually allow them to remove, we would give pre uh, the, the primacy to the culverts and to this entire project. So ultimately is that we would just ultimately give out whatever wasn't necessary for this project and move forward. Mr. Arte. Mayor, I wanted to add that actually phase three, the, the concrete lining I think is crucial just because any amount of rain clogs up those culverts and it's quickly all of the debris comes down and there's a potential that that excavation would fail if we don't do anything with that concrete lining coming from stockyard to thunder. So, I, I mean, I think that what we're proposing is phase two and three, correct? I think that the the direction here is to go with this one first. Um, and then we can actually allow the public to come in and excavate the remaining portion of the pond. Uh, because if you all took, and I really, let me see if we have a, so, so ultimately here is that if we, if we allow for the developer to come in and take an additional 90,000 
cubic yards of dirt is that this is our savings, right? So ultimately is that like the city manager is saying is that we can do both of them uh, and we would still probably have a cost savings that we showed earlier. Mr. How much money did you allocate for this project through the capital? I, I think it was over $4 million in its totality. Yes, I think we yeah. allocated $5 million, correct? Right. Yes. R right. So, so, so the we funding didn't have is available through our seals. Yes, absolutely. So so the project that you're seeing here would be covered. Okay. Mr. Rodriguez? And, 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 and I think we should work on both of them because what you saw is that it was already clogged. Mm -hmm. And if you remember <laughs> where the culvert's at, it's already ground level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember, it used to be a couple of feet higher, like maybe nine feet high wall water. And the water, if it clogs, it's already at ground level. So we already been here in 2013 where the water reached, I think, seven feet higher than the road when it busted open. So th that's something that we have to address. I think that we have to do both so that we can maintain the culverts. And I think that's, that's the way to go. I mean, we have enough money to cover both. So, and then plus the cost savings that potentially is there. I think the only thing that has not been allocated is we need to do appraisals for the, the uh, private owners that we need to go out and negotiate. So then, um, did I make that the original motion? Your motion is to approve. To approve. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd like to go ahead and add to my motion um, and allow staff to do whatever is necessary to, to get the phase uh, going forward. So then that would include um, uh, the, the appraisals, the surveying, and all yeah. of that. And then we would come back and provide numbers to council before we would do anything. Okay. Second. And we have a speaker for this item, Miriam Cruz. Hello. We can hear you. Hello. Go ahead, Ms. Cruz. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. So I, my question, um, one, I want to thank um, the local for checking if I had or if any speakers were needed. In the previous item, I'm glad you guys hushed out the entire thing. Uh, as that, uh, I was surprised that I didn't sign up for that one, but you guys answered my questions. For this item, I have, I have two questions. One, about the, um, as you guys saw in, in one of the slides and some of the pictures, there's a lot of dumping that's going on. And so I wanna know one, what's gonna happen or what is the city preparing to do to avoid that dumping. One idea that I've had, and I haven't brought it up to any of you or, or Ms. Olarte, um, was actually creating an ordinance or updating an ordinance because there's already one. Uh, um, creating a fine, a hefty fine for dumping, for illegal dumping. Obviously, the TCQ, the county, the state already has um, things like that, but I think as a city, uh, we should capitalize on having our own ordinance that, you know, uh, gives a fee or a ticket to whoever is dumping, uh, especially in these areas that you know we're spending so much money on. We don't want them getting clogged up with mattresses or tires or whatnot. Um, and my second question, which is a question that I've had since the very beginning of, of this project, was how is the Cielo Azul and now the new Cielo going to be affected um, on, on, on stockyards um, by this project? Uh, I understand that at the bottom or the end of fields, it has been... Um, dug uh, pretty well, 10 feet. Uh, it's pretty deep, I guess, now compared to what it was. Ms. Cruz, but your time is my up. My question is the railment on the, along Stockyard, how far deep is that going to go? And right. I, I guess to, to the body is that just for clarification, is that under the MS4? program is that the fine for contaminating any fluvial channel is a thousand dollars per violation so it is extent but that's provided that you actually catch them or there's some way of, of tracing the the perpetrators yes sir yeah. 
René Rodriguez. Aye. Sister Nevarez is absent. Ruel Turan. Yes. Victor Perez. Aye. And Ivan Colombia Lo. Yes. Item number 22. Discussion and action regarding the area known as the Varela subdivision, including infrastructure and services available to residents and access to and mobility in it. Mr. Rodriguez, actually, do we have a motion first? Make a motion to approve. To Second. Okay. Mr. Rodriguez. Um, I, I, I've been uh, speaking with the residents here at Varela. Um, this is this is another area where every time it rains, these individuals can't uh, go to their homes. They leave their their uh, they leave their vehicles out in the subdivision uh, that is being built, um, and then they have to walk in the mud, and that's every day. I was there yesterday or the day before, um, and these individuals. I understand what they're going through because just like uh, Fray Olguin and other streets, um, they're going through the same predicament, is their vehicles get stuck, they can't go to work, they can't go to school. Um, it's just horrible conditions. I know that uh, one of the gentlemen that I spoke to uh, about a week ago, um, wife is on a wheelchair and it's very difficult to go to the, the clinic or the hospital um, and get her, her medications and stuff because they can't leave the house. Uh, there's uh, other children there that, that have, uh, you know, uh, needs and, um, and they can't receive them. What happens to these individuals if they need uh, emergency services? They're not able to get them. The fire department, the, uh, the, um, the ambulance services, will get stuck to get there. So you can look at the video and that's what they have to go through to reach their home. And it's, it, you'll get stuck. As we're watching the video here, uh, a couple of things. Um, is, is this um, private road? Is this a private road, number one? This is, they're going through a farmland. So this is somebody's farmland. This is somebody's farmland. How about yes. their roads? Are they private? And their road is is stopped. Um, mm -hmm. I showed Mr. Nevarez earlier mm -hmm. uh, when I went where I parked my car, my vehicle, mm -hmm. and then I had to go into there because the subdivision is being built, and mm -hmm. we they have uh, they put in rails, mm -hmm. and they did they blocked the street. All we need to do is uh, uh, remove them. Uh, plan out and 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 uh, just give them some some um, some base so that they can temporarily uh, uh, use the road. Miss Miss uh, Rodarte, what can we legally do to help them? Okay, so it's it's private property, and I think um, it's important to know that all these properties are landlocked. There is an owner that is mostly the owner of all this land that, that we can't get a hold of to sign. The paperwork. The only thing that's changed in the 30 years that they've been there is that with the new development um, coming up on Jesus Barrera, is when they place the road, they put a guardrail, allowing not allowing them to exit through where they would go and and exit exit the, I guess the highway. <clears throat> so what they're asking is, if we can just remove the guardrail and they can pretty much put all the materials. All they want is an exit that's not as long as that road that you're looking at right now. And, and sorry, that, was that guardrail, the one I had requested for Flor no. Blanca? No? no, no, okay. Just, no, just no. making sure it wasn't. The guardrail was placed through the new development. I'm on the other oh, side. okay, the developers okay. placed Got the... It. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a street that's maybe a quarter mile long, shorter than that, and that's the long way. The easier way is on the other end of the street, um, you'll be able to see, and it's it's all like that. Um, you'll be able to see straight over there, you can, by those trees in the middle, you can see that there's cars, mm -hmm. and that's where they, they station their vehicles. And I walked it, 
and it's just horrible. It, it really is. I mean, these people have to walk through mud. And, um, it, and it's just like Ormsby. Yes, uh, it's, we're it's like Ormsby, in the same situation. And it's and it's and it's the same thing mm -hmm. as as uh, Fray Olguin. Right in the middle, everybody's property goes right to the center of the, the middle mm -hmm. of the street. Yeah, I'm sorry. Is that, I mean, are, is that a delicate, is the work delicate? And, no, and it's what they want to do. Uh, they already have signatures, except for the ladies in the front, which they want to know, take action for the city to try to do it. And as soon as we take action, they can bring the document, they can bring the, I already know that Mr. Flores uh, said, when you guys take it, we'll take the documentation to her so she can sign. And Because you mm -hmm. see the guardrails on the top by the tree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see and the guardrails, the guardrails are there. So the only two, the lady owns the left and the right hand side of the property, right there. So she hasn't said no. She just hasn't signed because she can't come to the city because she's an elderly woman. So they'll do it for us, but they want us to help them to say, okay, we'll get you the signatures. Yeah, I, I would. I, I would ask that we have like somebody from the city president yes only because i i agree you know if i'm going with that yes I'm for her to say well i was forced to sign yes that way there's that the, that uh want to make sure that uh, there's no that we're trans as transparent as possible and their you know the city is there present witnessing uh the the signature that nobody coerced her to, and, and, to, and signing. to signing of course so and the, i agree the, the only issues that i have is that if we help these people on Varela, why can't we do the same thing for Ormsby or for the other streets? Because we've always Be told them it's their responsibility to get the land no, dedicated. That's not true. No, it's not true. it's not true. It's not true. Yes, it's not true, Mayor. Can I, can I answer that? No, okay, yes. Part of it, Mr. Lobos? If you don't mind. Um, for those that are hearing, this is District 4 Representative Ms. Yvonne Colombia Lobos. And we have something similar to this. Um, Unfortunately, because of or Ornsby, we have a totally different situation. Everybody's in agreement except one, one gentleman that we cannot get a hold of. And uh, the person that did get a hold of him for me, he said he wasn't interested. He's not interested in signing. He was, it, that, that place was, in, he inherited it, and he, he's not interested for whatever reason. He, is, he has misconceptions of that taxes are going to go up higher and he can't afford them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is the reason we can't help Ornsby. But this area here, you're telling me everybody's in agreement, mm -hmm. except that one lady needs these documents to be signed. We can come to her house. and But if I'm not mistaken, I heard them asking that we help them with, I guess, putting a road. Well, we, just the, like Fray Olguin, we did. Okay. Because we have to provide services. It's not just the signature. Right. But yes. Once we have everything now. Once we have yes. everything. We are going to do the street, okay. you know, and gotcha. that's what we, what, that's what we want. We mm -hmm. just need to start the process. Right. And therefore that's what we want is that we mm -hmm. want to start the process so that we can have one of our staff members to go out with Mr. Uh, Flores, to go out with this lady mm -hmm. so that we can verify, like, like Mr. Perez said, mm -hmm. to the, to know that nobody coerced anybody, nobody forced their hand to do mm -hmm. it. She willingly did it. She sends our, 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 yes. Okay, so it's not that simple. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> All I'm saying is we need we to start the process. Yes, we have not done any homework like we have on Ormsby. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we need to go back and see if they're owed, because on Ormsby, there's taxes that are owed from this property owner that doesn't want to sign mm -hmm. and doesn't want to pay their taxes. Yes. Right. Right. So the city can't. But for, for Varela residents, we haven't really gone in there and done. I know that there was some agreements that started when Mr. Leone was here. However, the attorney has reviewed and we probably need to start all the process all over again. What are, we're requesting right now is to direct staff to go out, get with the attorneys, research exactly what it is that we need to do mm -hmm. in order to be able to assist them. Okay, in the meantime, what these residents are asking is to remove that guardrail. Right, in the meantime, while we figure out because right now they have no access to come out. And we, if we remove that guardrail, we also need to get guidance from the attorney. Mm -hmm. What is required before we remove that guardrail? Mm -hmm. Right. So if we can legally, if we can just it. start the process, mm -hmm. 
that's what we, we want to do. We want to start the process and then we ask our attorneys for legal advice, so forth and so forth, so we can move forward. But today we need to make a decision whether we're going to remove that. No, no, or no, not. we're not doing we can, that. What we we're doing is staff, no? we're going to direct our staff to see what, wanna... what we need to do. Well, there's an urgency here because of yes. all the rain. Yes. So we either make a decision whether we remove it now remove it temporarily. I think you can approve to remove mm -hmm. based on what legal gives staff of what are, what right. are, what conditions do we need to place? What, I mean, we just need to look into it a little bit more. We just needed guidance from council. If that's something that you all wanted to proceed with. Mr. Perez. If we're talking about the removal of the guardrail rail, and I don't know, maybe you all already discussed this, uh, any ramifications from the removal? I mean, does it impact safety in any way i mean there is a reason why it was placed there i'm sure what is the reason i mean what so there is a significant significant drop mm -hmm. um when you remove the guardrail okay the thing is is that that guardrail did not exist they had nothing they had filled it okay. and they were driving through it but when the contractor the developing started moving dirt around and then they put it, it kind of all dissolved okay and that's where it's it stopped them from being able to exit their residence is because that guardrail was placed there but they used to not have a guardrail there so it was just all land the drop still existed however they they managed to put it was material a shift bridge then. yes mm -hmm. <clears throat> that they did it on their own uh, uh, a dirt bridge mm -hmm. yes but it's not a dirt bridge. So Mr. Flores provided us a presentation. If you can go to the other slides and he is um, signed up to speak to this item. Okay. But I wanted you to kind of see where that guardrail was placed. And I'll let Mr. Flores explain, but that's, there's the guardrail. Okay. Just, just to add to that, where, where the, the truck was going to is on the other side, right? Right. So I, I guess to to expand the 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 mobility of this uh, subdivision is that prior to this development coming in, they were traversing uh, through Scove Road, which is down here, and then they would uh, essentially uh, come through this area that is owned by uh, the Varela family, and they would come in to uh, the subdivision here. So in, in times, what they did is that they constructed, if you will, a ramp uh, to access this grade difference, and then they would meander through here and then ultimately hit Alameda. So as the city manager has pointed out, is that uh, we do require uh, the developers to put the barricade um, when there is no further access to it. Right. So throughout the the, uh, the area, we do have other stub outs that do have the barricade. But what they're requesting um, through their coordinated effort through the entire subdivision and the people who live there is that they would incur the development of such a ramp so that they can meander this way rather than try to go out the other way. Is it doable? Mr. Perez? Is it doable? I mean, is is it reasonable to do? Like, I mean, as far as safety and all those things? Well, well, I think that when we're looking at the police power that the city has is that it has to examine not only safety, but also the health and the morale of the community. Okay. And so you know, the city manager and I went out there and, and, you know, I would agree that the condition is desperate. Um, and so, again, this is another assignment the city manager has given to me, and we've gone back and forth in discussion what we really can and can't do. Uh, but, but ultimately, like I pointed out, is that this is one of many others that we've discussed. Uh, but essentially, like I gave my example of Tech Stop, is that the reason we have FM roads and RM roads is because they're called farm to market, branch to market. So at the time, Tech Stop said we got to get the farmer out of the mud. So therefore, in Textot's uh, philosophy is that we will build them roads. Okay, one so, last question, only because I'm playing devil's advocate, and I'm not saying that I'm against this, but I just, in terms mm -hmm. of questions, 
if we if that guardrail was to be removed, are we in some way helping the owners uh, in terms of it not being a a public um, good, rather that it's more for private interests? You know how we say about improving, we can't use public efforts or public funding to improve private property. This one touch on that? Well, I, I think certainly this is a legal question, uh, but but uh, but again, is that the guardrail is there because simply when a development is built out and there's no continuous roadway okay. that is dedicated to the city, um, it's imposed on, on the developer. Um, as it was noted, is that this area is not dedicated to the city. It's not plotted. There's multiple owners. Uh, but I think that we would ultimately have to ask uh, legal counsel for that. Mr. Arte, and I want to stress that the, the difference between Ormsby and Varela is that Ormsby is a very short length of street. Mm -hmm. And the ambulance can park on Middle Drain. And it's a very short distance. distance. Mm -hmm. This one, if the ambulance were to park there, and they would have to get someone with a wheelchair all the way to the guardrail, it's, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the ambulance people will not go in there. And I think that's where the, the stress of the urgency is that I know um, Mike is technical and, and we, you know, kind of, however, we're here to help these people. Absolutely. I agree. So how do we come to a, yes, I know there's a liability, but I know that there's, I mean, these people really are out in the middle of nowhere and the distance is tremendous. I mean, we went out there and I mean, it's, field after field after mm -hmm. field, and that's a shorter length, but that's only for the, the first neighbor that's there. They're not the ones uh, suffering from, you know, having people that are uh, disabled. But it, it, it is a concern to me that if something were to happen, the ambulance won't go in there. Mm -hmm. well, it's a liability all the way around, whether we do something or we don't do mm -hmm. anything. Mr. Rodriguez? Mayor, thank you. Um, if you if you remember if you recall back to the video that you saw right. when it took a turn and you saw a red little Honda I believe that is where and it's and it and it still turned to the left and you still see down the street when mm -hmm. I said and I pointed it out over there is where they park mm -hmm. okay right there in the middle of that street is where the the gentleman's wife is it has to be mm -hmm. uh, with the wheelchair mm -hmm. and you saw all of the mud and stuff. And those are the, those are the things that uh, I walked it. Mm -hmm. I walked it with them. I, I, I feel for them because that's what we're elected for. We're elected to serve and to help our community. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody throws to our faces that we don't do nothing, that, oh, we're taxpayers and, and this and that. But it's not about if you pay taxes or not. It's about if we're here to to provide you and give you not only the quality of life, but you deserve to be able to, to when you call our, our police department, when you call our emergency services, you have that right so that they can go to your doorstep. No, that's basic basic you health and that, welfare. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the, the, it's, it's, it's something that, mm -hmm. God forbid, something happens to these individuals. And then you have the other children that need, you know, that, that have some special needs further down the, uh, the, the, the street. So, I mean, all I'm saying is we need to start the, the process in acquiring so that we can build them a road. And um, Ms. Elvis, do, do we need to remove the, the whole, I, I noticed that it's pretty long. Does the whole thing need to come down or just enough for a couple of vehicles to pass through? Well, I think ultimately is that, you know, we, we could come back and look at where it's more feasible. Uh, I mean, the guardrail is quite extensive. Uh, the ramp is shorter than that. And I think that if you look at the, the exhibit here where I'm pointing at is that I think we could fit a vehicle to go down there. And an ambulance and a fire department. I mean, fire truck. Well, I, again, because you're talking about a heavier vehicle uh, and its capability to, to go down that ramp. Mm -hmm. But it would be better for the people to be able 
able to access up to that end. Okay. And get them to the other one. As opposed to right now, they have to go all around mm -hmm. because of this guardrail that mm -hmm. exists. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that one is still going to go in there. You're going to have to remove the ramp. Gotcha. To remove the guardrail. Gotcha. But people would be able to access to them. Okay. And bring them to the ambulance. Yeah. Because they're willing to put material, it's mm -hmm. just the guardrail doesn't allow them to exit. Okay. Area. And the ground is still unstable when it rains and stuff like that. So, right. so right. right now, I don't think we've clarified what we're what we're doing right now. I think we need to direct staff to look into it, but also um, ask legal for just to make sure that everything is legal for advice, I guess, to see to make sure that we don't take off the rail and then we're in more of a situation than we are now. We do need to make sure that they are able to get access to an ambulance, but it's not going to happen anytime soon, but at least a short term. So we don't know yet. In the meantime, mm -hmm. quick fix. So, what's the motion? So, I make the motion to approve the process okay. and to look into removing the the guardrail, the, the guardrail as, soon as, as soon as possible and uh, get legal involved as soon as possible as well to start getting the proper signatures and start rolling with, with the acquisition of, the, of land. Second. Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores. Señor Flores. Yes, yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes, sorry, there's a delay. I, um, yes. Mr. Flores, um, Hello? we're here to listen to your concerns on item number 22. Well, um, Steve, earlier you guys were talking about a uh, building a park and how you guys you know, are excited about building the quality of life. And, and, and right now, when we're asking for, for um, assistance, you know, I'm getting kind of, uh, you know, kind of like a roadblock. I mean, right now, my only way out is to scope road. Uh, that's my only way out right now. If, if that were to, if, if it rains and there's no, um, there's no access for me to come in and out and my wife or my kids or my neighbors, they have a medical emergency. I mean, you know, there's no way of anybody getting here. And that kind of, that kind of bothers me that, you know, you're concerned about quality of life, but when residents need, uh, emergencies, I mean, we need, um, medical staff here, it's, you know, I mean, we need it. We, we need this call. Mr. Flores, can you hear me? This is Victor Perez. Yes. Uh, just to let you know that on the on the table right now, there is a motion to approve uh, for staff to look into uh, removing the guardrail rail, if appropriate, because we need to make sure that we do it legally. Obviously, we we have to make sure that that's done. But in, in terms of trying to support your efforts. Uh, that that motion would allow um, staff to proceed with whatever is necessary in terms of signatures, in terms of legal advice, and so we can uh, continue with the dedication of that road, plus, again, removing that guardrail to at least uh, improve the access. It, it's not the best situation at this point, but it is getting closer to what we want to achieve in terms of you all having full access. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so we're going to take that, that, uh, that vote in a little bit. I can't say that it'll pass, but it seems very, very probable that it would. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if, uh, if they could remove as, as a removable rail, the temporary access, you know, that would help tremendously. Right. And again, I mean, uh, tremendously. and again, we just want to make sure 
uh, because we have that uh, we have that uh, responsibility to make sure that what we're doing is correct and legal. So that will be uh, that will go through a legal review so that we can expedite that if at all possible. Yeah, definitely. And uh, uh, my neighbors and I, we're, we're very active. We're very excited. Um, anything that we can do. I mean, I've been taking time from my job to go get signatures. Mr. Flores, your time uh, is up. Anything that we can do, we're ready. We're, we're more than ready to help out. Thank you, sir. Ms. Velagos? Mm -hmm. No, I'm, he, he said it all for me. Thank you. Do we have any other speaker, speakers? Miriam Cruz? Hi, I just, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Ms. Cruz, go ahead. So uh, I don't, I don't have many comments other than the fact that, um, other than the fact that you guys, um, I mean, this is obviously seems like a very important problem. The video is astounding. The, the scenario is um, very, very, very sad. Uh, the wheelchair, the, the older people, the in and out, the, the length of time that it gets, that it takes these people to get out um, of their of their houses is it's crazy. And I'm glad that you guys brought this agenda item to to the city council, but um, I guess my own concern is, um, you know, I wish <laughs> other things moved at this fast, and I'm glad it's going to hopefully happen for them. I just, I just wish that other things could also happen this fast. But I'm glad that you guys brought it to the agenda. Okay, thank you. Karina Alvarez. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Soy Karina, mi nombre es Karina. Soy la vecina de aquí de la subdivisión de la Varela. Nada más les quiero comentar que desde el año 1981 se compraron lotes en esta subdivisión. En el 2002 adquirió este terreno. En el 2003 construí la casa. En el 2007, hace 13 años, firmamos por primera vez letters of agreement que no nos han resuelto nada. En el 2006 recibí carta de la ciudad de Special Block 12, Rack 9. En noviembre del 2007 recibí otra carta para residentes de Varela. En agosto del 2011 recibí carta de notificación. Ahorita ya estamos en el 2020, ya casi 40 años desde el 81. Que los primeros residentes viven aquí sin calle, ni siquiera un camino decente para entrar y salir. Hace aproximadamente unos meses terminaron un pavimento en la calle Maguey, que está a menos de 200 pies de nuestra propiedad y no podemos entrar ni salir por ahí. Nos bloquearon con baile y estamos pidiendo la ayuda urgente para que nos den acceso a esa calle. Ya somos aproximadamente 10 vecinos que estamos de acuerdo en luchar, en no rendirnos, y no dejar que pase más tiempo. Queremos que quiten esa valla, traerles, traer viajes de caliche o veis temporalmente. Señora Álvarez, no le ha terminado su tiempo. Ni años para esto. Pues ya lo vos. Solo las personas que vivimos aquí, sabemos el estrés, pasamos cada vez que llueve. Mis Álvarez, ya se le terminó su no, tiempo. Eh, vamos a estar trabajando con ustedes okay. para resolver esta situación. Mis diálogos. Ok. César Ornelas. Sí, bueno. Señor Ornelas. Bueno. Sí, buenas tardes. Sí, mire, eh, soy de otro de los de, de aquí de la calle Varela. Este, es de suma urgencia que nos ayuden, la verdad. Este, lo que están comentando, hay gente minusválida, la señora de ruedas, hay, hay este, dos personas ya mayores de edad, y realmente es, es inconcebible lo que pasamos, ¿verdad? Solamente nosotros, o si vienen aquí, se dan cuenta de lo que estamos pasando. Y es mucho el tiempo que tenemos solicitando el apoyo. Es la primera vez que acudimos a ustedes y les, les, les 
agradeceríamos que esta vez hicieran algo por nosotros. Este, sabemos que ustedes están por la gente y para la gente. Y si quisiéramos realmente que eh, eh, su esfuerzo se encaminara al beneficio de, de la gente que representan. Necesitamos su ayuda y la necesitamos de verdad. Les agradecería que hicieran algo de verdad y que, que no se quede nada más en, en promesas. Eh, quisiera ver resultados y este, cambiar la opinión que tengo ahorita de, de, de toda esta situación respecto de ustedes. Gracias. May you those all our speakers. ¿Me sé la voz? Uh, lo voy a decir en español porque casi todos hablaron en español. Este, nomás quiero que entiendan si nos están viendo, si nos están escuchando, de que estamos de su parte. Número uno, estamos de su parte. Eh, donde se nos traba un poquito es donde la ley dice que no podemos hacer ciertas uh, cosas hasta que ciertas cosas estén en orden. Y, y, y eso es lo que vamos a tratar de, espero, ¿verdad?, que todos voten uh, por eso. Vamos a tratar de, de poner primero las cosas en orden para poder asistirles inmediatamente, ¿verdad? Ya que estamos de su parte, queremos que ustedes también algún día tengan carretera, este, que toda su vecindad este, esté de acuerdo y firmen. Sin, esa, sin esos, el 100% de participación de, de la gente que vive, los dueños de esos terrenos no participa, no firma. Estamos uh, con las manos, este, um, a, ¿cómo se dice? Amarradas. Atadas. Porque no nos... Um, la ley, la ley, la ley no nos permite, no nosotros. Eh, sí, hacemos sí, un concilio muy diferente, estamos conscientes y más ahora que vimos los videos de lo que está pasando ahí. Estamos conscientes que este, no es uh, ideal como viven ustedes allí. Este, nomás les pedimos que por favor nos den, ya que, tenemos, ya que todos sabemos lo que está pasando, nos den este, el tiempo que necesitamos para hacer lo que, uh, para hacer lo mejor con la ley, ¿verdad? Que la ley nos deje, este, uh, y espero que nos entiendan, y estamos aquí para servirles, no piensen que hacemos el concilio de antes, este, y, y gracias por, por este, por esperarnos, ya es, ya es muy tarde, pero sé que es importante para ustedes. Mr. Arte. I mean, I'm just kind of thinking outside the box about the guardrail. Instead of removing it, why not allow it to kind of like a swing, right? Uh, open when they're going to exit or come in and then be able to close it for the other public, right? Because it's there, I guess. I mean, I'm just kind of thinking outside the box of how we can move this forward. Mr. Perez? I think that... Um, no, well, I, I think if we're going to just remove it, we just need to remove it. Um, because even if if you have, if obviously if they, if they can open it, other people can open yeah. it. So the only thing that I have a concern about, and but it's something that's going to have to be mitigated somehow, is all those three wheelers and, and those people that like to go off roading and those if they have that kind of traffic. But other than that, um, I think that if we can do it, just go ahead and, and get you know, it. René Rodríguez. This is to approve, start the process to acquire the uh, right of way so that we can build them a road. And at the same time, um, to look into the possibility of removing the guardrails um, and then uh, for the accessibility that they deserve. And, and you don't, I'm sorry, and you don't have to come back to us if, if yes. council says, you know, it can be removed, have, don't, don't come back to us. Just yeah. Have it removed. Just, yes? just get it done. Just get it done. There's no need for redundancy here. Mm -hmm. um, so, I. Yes. Cesar Nevarez. Yes. Ralph Duran. Yes. Victor Perez. I. Ivan Colombia Lobos. Yes. Item number 23. Discussion and action on charter oh, amendments. Mayor, can you let them know that uh, their item agenda just passed, and that we're gonna. Are they still online? Oh. Okay. Okay. They're, he, they're still on? 
Mr. Okay. Just to there? just to let the public know, item number 22 did pass. Para dejarles saber, um, la ciudad va a trabajar para encontrar una manera de hacerles una calle en el futuro y para quitar la ba barrera si es legalmente posible. Gracias. Item number 23, discussion and action on charter amendments, articles 3, section 3.04 through 3.06. Mr. Perez? Um, <clears throat> where it says under amendment number three on the first page, it says have resided for at least 12 months preceding the election within city limits. And here have resided within their district 12 months preceding the election. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's correct if you're part of a district or representing a district, but if you're at large, then, then you would have to have, you would need to live uh, within the city. Mm -hmm. What section is that, sir? Uh, amendment, well, amendment number three on um, first. the first page, the very first page of the... The 3.04, uh, the general a, powers It would be, changes? no, it no, would be 3.02B. Okay, so the, the 3.01, the one you, that you're seeing, District 2 in the top, uh -huh. those were comments that were made by District 2. Oh, I see. To add to the changes that is attached okay. in the after that page. Oh, I see. I see. I apologize. Okay. Um, and if you can see on the on the page behind that are That's District Three uh, recommendations, right. right? So those are just recommendations that were presented through by have, District Two. My bad. And District Three, and then you can see the three point zero four general powers and duties. Okay. Those are the sections that we're actually viewing today. My bad. Sorry. So for the District 2, I think his recommendation was on Article 3, Section 3.04. He wanted to delete the for good cause order a recall election be held for or with respect to any member of the City Council. He is recommending to delete that. And then also, I don't know if you want to move on or... No, that's, that's uh, the article three, section 3.06, third paragraph, all vacancies shall be filled by election for remainder of the un unexpired term of the office so filled. He wants to add all vacancies shall be filled by appointment for the remainder of the unexpired term of the office so filled. Mr. Renan? I think we need to add... Um... If it's so much time, we should have an election. But if it's a really short time, I, I think we should be able to appoint somebody and whoever is appointed cannot run for that office. Mm. I don't know what you think about that. I, <clears throat> if, I mean, oh. I'm, I'm trying to save $23,000 no, on a, an election if it's only like three months away. So this is, the, so then if, if you, Let's say that you were to appoint me. I'm qualified for the appointment, but I'm not qualified to run. Yeah, okay, I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, but, I, but that's that's how I would see yeah. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like the county, uh, the county, right? It's they appoint somebody uh, when the commissioners, right? But they they have a your word is your bond, I guess, and and they'll tell you that if we appoint you, then you're not going to run. Right, so that they, they pick individuals that are going to be appointed just for that, and then they won't be able to run. I don't really like that idea. That's a gentleman's agreement, because, I guess. Yeah, that's a gentleman's agreement. So I don't really like that because how can you say, what if that person turns out to be a very good representative? And what happens if he likes it and mm -hmm. people like him or her? Mm -hmm. Right, so you're going to hinder them of not doing a, a job 
that they're eligible for. So, I mean, th those are things that, that, uh, that I think, I don't know, that's, I think that we should just. I can understand appointing somebody it, and then un, un, until the next election, so you won't have a special election. And if that person wants to run at that point, that's up to them. Um, but certainly it, it, it may be more cost effective to include them in, in elections that are going to be held anyway. I mean, I, I was just going by what the county has done. Right. And I think that uh, I, I like that idea. I mean, if somebody is going to be doing the job, they should be able to run for the position. I, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. Okay. See what everybody else thought. But I do, I do think that to save us money, maybe uh, six months, if somebody, uh, if there's a, a vacancy within six months of the election, that they be appointed, appointed or for you know the whole term i don't know i think i think that we do have to put a, a limit because that way then the people can decide who they want in that position whether it be somebody that we that we appoint but to try and save some money let's put a maybe a one year limit if, so if anything, there's a vacancy anything before the limit would just leave it vacant i mean we appoint is that what you're saying yeah i'm saying if, let's say that um the term is one year before it's going to expire. Then we appoint somebody for that year. But if it's like two years, then we hold an election. Or, or, any, yeah, or anything, any, if an individual, individual has to serve as an appointment longer than a year, then you call for a special election. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's good. I think a year. That, again? that if, if an appointment is going to serve beyond a one year mark, then you would have you would hold a special election. If not, if if the appointments for a year or less, you would wait until the next regular election. Mm -hmm. And that's that's all that that would be. Yeah. I mean, when I, I think one year would be good. I, 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 I could agree to that. Well, yeah, because I mean, I we, think I think I could. It could be a number of things that happen. Yeah, I mean, somebody Illness, could pass away, uh, uh, moving, like we've Mr. Had, Bolin, mm -hmm. like yeah. Mr. Bolin, and then somebody moves. You can yeah. appoint somebody until uh, such time we, that a special election. Range. Yeah, I think that's a, a good idea. Because I think there is um, uh, when somebody, uh, if, if there's a vacancy, we have to have an election within a certain amount of time. 120 days. 120 days. So it Just would be, months. yeah. So However, it, I don't know if the municipality has the authority to appoint an elected official. We'll have to, to say that. leave right. that up so to Jim. We have Jim see if he can, on the line. If, Jim? Yeah. We hope. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Jim. Mayor. Hey. <laughs> no, yeah, no snoozing on the job. The answer is probably. Um, there's actually a, the city, the government code says vacancies are filled in accordance with the city charter. So if you, if we do a charter election and prescribe that method in the charter, yes, I think you can do it the way you're describing. The one interesting quirk is the Texas constitution. <laughs> says that the city must fill, must do it by election. special election, but it only applies to cities with a population over 1.5 million, oh. and only if there's nine months or more left in the in the term. <laughs> so well, let me get to the bottom of that, and I'm, off the top of my head, yes, if you provide for that in your charter, yes, I think you can do that. So we would have to wait until after the census to see if we're up to 1.5 million. <laughs> Yes. No, we're not. It's going to be close. Let me just tell you right now. <laughs> Mr. Rafa, on section 3.05 on the compensation section, I know that Mr. Cassiano wanted us to talk a little bit about um, the benefits that council receives is not part of our charter, and he would feel more comfortable if we were to place that in the charter on on the charter that council is receiving these benefits under compensation or where compensation or create a a paragraph saying benefits to stipulate what benefits the council authorizes or that you know through the charter because there's nothing uh, covering us right now because we're if we elect we can opt for like insurance and stuff like that, correct? Correct. Right now we currently yeah. have 
several council members that do uh, receive benefits, but that's nowhere in the charter. So then, yeah. So then the uh, I guess the wording would be something similar to council members will, uh, are eligible to receive. Correct. So we can put compensation slash benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then uh, maybe benefits are the same as the current employees are mm -hmm. currently mm -hmm. enrolled on yeah. or something to that effect. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so that'd be compensation and ben benefits? Correct. On section 3.05, we'll just add benefits to that, and then we'll um, add the some verbiage that will cover us. Where's Mr. Casiano's? Uh... He didn't include it. He just let the city manager know. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was like. Okay. So they're gonna come back with some wording. Okay, perfect. They're just gonna add it though. So that's fine. Yeah, because I was looking at this chicken scratch. Nah. I'm yeah, just yeah. Nah, I'm just I, I, I know, love your penmanship though. Mine's lousy. Now nah, that's chicken scratch. Uh change conference. Okay. So then if we change um, the appointment language, we need to change it on their vacancies as well, correct? The one, the one that you want it, Mr. Zeman? We need to change it on section 3.06? Yeah. Okay. Are you, are you taking down the, for one year. the changes to the rule? For one year? Yeah. For one, yeah, under 3.06 in the vacancies, uh -huh. which would be the one year appointment. Uh, if the vacancy happens within a year of the term ending. Anything more than a year would go through a special, a special election. And Jim was going to check on that. Yeah. For cities of, for one point, I don't know how many million, how many million? Okay, I, I. And Mr. Rodriguez? Yes, on the uh, compensation, section 3.05, compensation, it says uh, mayor shall receive $15,000 per year, and each council member uh, shall receive $10,000 per year compensation for their services. You know, this is this is uh, since the inception of the city since 1986, and it's since 1986. And I think that you know, um, and it was volunteer first, and then they, you and know, they... yeah. And 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 I understand. I mean, we're not we're not asking, or should I say, I'm not asking for to be rich like senators and and Congress people who are living off the land per se and then all of a sudden they become millionaires i mean we're not doing that but i mean i i think that you know it is time to compensate the mayor and council i think that we should increase it instead of 15 to twenty thousand, and then fifteen thousand for council members that's it's just something to throw out there i mean i i truly believe that because we do a lot of work some of us go out um i, I know that uh, we have meetings outside uh, on the weekends and in our nights and stuff, and we go visit constituents and stuff. Um, we have meetings throughout the week. We have to take time off of our work um, and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I think that we should co be compensated for whatever we're missing at work. And I just think that we should um, come up with a formula because it's going to be the same thing. Um, we're going to be 20 years down the road and inflation and they're going to be or, or we could do that we can do that <clears throat> so that we way we don't have the to come back and change it ratio of what what 15,000 translated in 86 and we can use that ratio well, i'm not sure exactly if it was in 86 i know that i think the first council 
was volunteer and then subsequent to that or some, we can i mean whenever we can look it, it up it. in the records and then we can go f from there you know wait 725 why wouldn't we be able to put verbiage that compensated minimum wage that's, that's what we're saying like something like evolving. a formula that way it evolves okay. with the time yeah yeah of course and, and i'm just saying like for the mayor just up it a little bit more you know, for 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 mayor, just to, 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 inflation, you know, I I would, you know, I mean, yes, sir. Uh, I would suggest, and this is just for discussion purposes, twenty five mayor and twenty twenty uh, council. Yeah, but then four years from now, when they no, yeah, mayor, you, but, I would say just put it at the prevailing minimum wage, minimum wage. So right now, minimum wage, if you're working a 40-hour job, it's 15000 with $80. Well, there you go, minimum wage. So probably well, mayor's be. making minimum wage. <laughs> Council isn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> no, no, I like, I like what you said, but we have to formulate it. So I, I think, I, think I, I guess because, think about it. I'm, I'm not going to be here forever. Really, I'm not. No, no, seriously. I'm, I'm, well, I'm you know, we so, <laughs> so. So what I'm saying is, no, no, because I have other plans. You know, I, I, I do. You know, I, I want to retire young, you know. Um, but uh, I want to go into the golf course heaven, you know, golf course heaven. Yeah, but anyways, make, a, like, make it short is we need to think of our future okay. colleagues, you know, and inflation and all of that. I, I think minimum wage because that is, keeps going up. Well, it, it, it will be, but I mean, this way, it's about the same, it's about the same what it is. It's a living document. So then, but, okay, so then if we're looking at, at minimum wages, it's fine. I mean, um, then everybody gets paid the same because if we're looking at minimum wage. How are you going to differentiate the functions of the mayor and the functions of city council? If some city council members, and I'll be the first one to admit that, I'm, you know, it's hard for me to 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 meet, make meetings sometimes that they're not putting in the same amount of time and effort, or the same amount, at least the same amount of time, versus a mayor. Again, it's there, there's that disparity in in time and service. Can I answer that? Is that I, I meet with anybody and everybody. That's my choice. That is my choice. I want to be in front. I want to be able to be the one that helps them. Um, and I completely understand. I put in a lot of time. Uh, I make a lot of phone calls. I make a lot of friends out of it. And I make a lot of, but that was my choice. Okay, that was my choice. Doesn't mean that you were any less uh, mm -hmm. a representative, but that was my choice to be in front, to be present for every, and, and I, I'm telling, I'll tell you something. It does take a toll on your heart. It takes a toll on your body. It takes a toll on your family, but and, That's and, what I've chosen. And I'm just talking about in terms of just the formulation. If, if, we're, if we're talking about using minimum wage as the <laughs> basis for for arriving at a, at a at an amount, then it would be the same for across the board. What we could do is um, council sense? members are at minimum wage, mayors at minimum wage, but plus put 1%. like no, plus put like a five thousand dollar on top of that. Because we'd be at 15, she'd be at 20, which is where Mr. Rodriguez had, had or somebody had had thought about. So that way there is, a, a, you know, the added, um, not bonus, but the added uh, amount of money for the position. You know, uh, if, you, if you really look at it, it's $9 at $20. I mean, at 20000 a year. And then, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's really not breaking the bank or anything like that. I mean, I think that that if we say, hey, we'll, we'll just leave it at X amount of money, and then with inflation, you know, just set just set a, a, a standard. Why don't we do a, a, a cost now or a cost comparison with other cities similar to Chicago in terms of size yeah. and see what what they make, and at that point, uh, I, I I agree. We can look at that too. Because you know we we can adjust we can uh, amend the charter every four years, but I mean as far as having a baseline, yes, yeah, um, 
we can we can research other cities. Yes. <laughs> no, in, in terms of compensation, that if we can look at uh, similar sized cities in terms of what they compensate their city uh, and how they compensate them, and and the formula they use, if 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 possible. Or if there's such a thing. Yeah. And that way we can go ahead and use that to create a baseline for our roots. Because I'm a quick meeting. <laughs> you still have to go in there, right? Yeah. So just just in closing, <laughs> also <laughs> if if there's if if, there, if we can't find anything like that, then we can just go back to the twenty five twenty, and then we can just put a provision on the charter to say that this will be revised every so often to include inflation or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's what we could do, mm -hmm. so that there will always be. Uh, uh, an inflation covered so it into get stuck. Right. right. Okay. The bigger question is, is does there have to be a compensation section on the chart? Maybe it's not required. Well, but maybe for, it's not, but I mean, for transparency. For tra exactly, yeah. because we know that in the past, before I was here, they were talking about giving themselves like sixty thousand or eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't want that. I mean, and, and and there's also the opposite effect where people say we make about a hundred thousand. I'm like, huh? Ah. No, <laughs> right? I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that that is true. No, yeah. sure. no. no. So, there. so, no. so, just like just for clarification, one more time, go out there and see what what's comparable, and then if not, bring us back. We can look at twenty five thousand for the mayor, twenty thousand for council members, with an inclusion of uh, of uh, inflation cost. Uh, to re be revised every four years. Okay. 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 We're now. Are we going into executive? Do we have a motion we to go into speaker. executive? We have a speaker. Oh, we have a speaker for this. Okay. okay. Miriam Cruz. Miriam Cruz. Miss Cruz. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, all I have to say is I wish I had more time. I had to rush back to work. I, I listened to what you said to your discussion. I agree with some of it, some of it I don't. Um, but I wish I had more time to not uh, look it over. I have no idea what you have to say. I don't, uh, the only thing I would like to, I guess, remind you, not that you guys need to mind your business, but, um, I believe that this part of when it goes on for a vote for election, it's either going to be a yes or a no. And so these things that I would caution council is that um, the public uh, is cautious in increasing. Although I believe that it is pretty old and outdated. Hello. Hello. Okay, go ahead. I don't know what that was. Um, and, and then anyway, so that, that's, that's the only thing I would say is maybe wording is important um, to think about when, because it is going to be a yes or no. So obviously there are a lot of changes that need to happen. Uh, so I would just hope that you get to word it in a way that people understand. Uh, and agree with it. That's it. With the with the and I'm talking about the the thing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Do we have a motion to go into executive session? Uh, make a motion to. Mayor. Jim. Yes, ma'am. I would suggest that the motion specified to go into, uh, that it's a motion to go into executive session to consult with your attorneys and deliberate regarding real real property. At this time, we want to move to executive to discuss uh, uh, with our attorney. Yes. Do we have a second? Second. second. I'm sorry. I was going to ask for a 
Rene Rodriguez. Aye. Sister Nevarez. Yes. Ralph Turan. Yes. Victor Perez. Aye. And Yvonne Colombia Lopez. Yes. 925, we're now in executive session. One moment while we kind of do the transition. All participants are on hold.
43, we're back in regular session. Item number 16. At this. Discussion and action to proceed with acquisition of properties for the North Nevada's roadway realignment. At this uh, moment, I would like to approve uh, so that administration could pro uh, proceed with acquisition of properties for the North Nevada's roadway realignment. Second. Miriam Cruz. Rene Rodriguez. Be, be, Mayor. Mr. Rodriguez. Before, I just want to say that uh, this is uh, uh, road improvements for the future. Uh, we do plan to uh, expand so that it, it could be uh, more, it could sustain more. Um, uh, vehicles. So I. Cesar Nevarez. Yes. Yes. Victor Perez. I. And Ivan Colombiano. Yes. <clears throat> um, you Aye. motion to delete items 24 through 26. Mm -hmm. Second. Rene Rodriguez. Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Yes. And Ivan Colombiano? Yes. Motion to adjourn. Second. Rene Rodriguez? Aye. Cesar Nevarez? Yes. Ralph Duran? Yes. Victor Perez? Aye. And Ivan Colombiano? Aye. 945, meeting adjourned. All righty. Good night. Good luck with dinner. <laughs>